minute. Well, I'm saying it's six o'clock. So I will go ahead and call to order the meeting of the Open Space Board of Trustees for February 10th, 2021. And as always, uh, because we may have some people listening and not uh, seeing the meeting, we'll start with the roll call of the board members. Hal Hallstein. I'm present. Karen Holweg. Here. Dave Kuntz. Here. Caroline Miller. Here. And I'm Kurt Brown. So Leah, we have all board members present. Um, just a quick look ahead on the agenda. Uh, we do not have any public hearings scheduled for this meeting, so the public may provide comment on any topic during our public comment period. Uh, I will now ask Allison Eklund to review the rules for the meeting and also to remind folks how they might, may sign up for our public comment period. Allison. Okay. Do you all see the slide? Yes. 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 Okay, so thank you for joining us tonight. These guidelines are to establish, oops, okay, a balance between meaningful engagement and online security. This meeting has been called to conduct the business of the city of Boulder. Activities that disrupt, delay, or interfere with the meeting are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions will be limited to the public comment and no person shall speak except when recognized by the person presiding. <clears throat> Each person shall register to speak at the meeting using a full first and last name. So if you have appeared and it just shows iPhone or Tom's iPad, for example, you will have to rename yourself with a full first and last name before we can unmute you. And if you don't know how to do that, you can chat, send me a chat and I can rename you. No video will be permit, permitted except for city officials, employees, and those invited by uh, speakers and presenters. All others will participate by voice only. The person presiding at the meeting shall enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates any rule. And the chat function is enabled to host only. So chats will go to me only. And those are for technical related questions. Um, if you can't hear or something happens with Zoom, but not for content questions related to the meeting. Only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screen during this meeting. And then Kurt, I can also go over if you wish to speak tonight, you can, um, raise your hand. If you hover over the participants icon, most likely at the bottom of your screen, you sh and open that participants box, there will be a raise the hand um, button, or sometimes it's now appearing in the reactions icon at the bottom of your screen. So check those two places later when we get to public comment, if you would like to raise your hand to speak. Thank you, Allison. And after we, uh, shortly after we approve the minutes, uh, we will have the public comment period. And at that time, I'll check in with Allison again to uh, remind folks uh, exactly how they can sign up if they haven't already. Um, Allison, just for my information, how many folks do we have signed up at this point? One, one signed up in advance. Okay, very good. Well, then we will go to the approval of the minutes for the Open Space Board of Trustees meeting of January 13th, 2021. Um, I'm gonna start on page one. I have a small wording change. Um, this is under agenda item two. And thank you to Leah for catching this. Um, it says Tony Ganaway spoke regarding voice and sight program. And there was a wording uh, switch there. And so the way it should read in that second sentence, he said no part of the voice and sight program is simple, rather than which is simple, is simple. However, it goes on, he suggested providing an area for dog guardians to be able to train their dogs on the open space system to improve adherence to the rules. Uh, so I will propose that change. I will also mention that uh, Mr. Ganaway uh, just sent us a note after uh, the meeting pointing out that there was uh, a discussion back in 2014 of creating such a uh, space for training of uh, dogs and dog guardians. 
other suggested changes to page one of the minutes? Uh, Hal, thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I rarely do this, but in agenda item three, um, under the Andy Pelster section on the agricultural land use assignment guidelines, I thought it would be worthwhile to put one sentence to note that the board did discuss and ask for clarifications on the uh, equity and inclusion elements of the scoring system. Would you like that to just follow where it said the boy, the board asked clarifying questions and suggestions and then go on to say? Yeah, uh, cert yeah however that's done. I just think that we, we spent a fair amount of time on it and I think it was worth noting. So would you just for Leah's and our benefit uh, say again then how you would word that sentence? Um, uh, yeah, uh, ask clarifying questions and provide suggestions for language within the application and related to the uh, equity inclusion elements of the scoring system. Okay, I see Leah nodding. That's always a good sign. Dave. Uh, yeah, I have, I have a minor suggestion and that is under uh, Francis Hartung's um, comments, the third line down, Leah, uh, right at the end of that line, it says lessening, lessening the within site measure. And I think site, I, that's a little hmm. weird as far as <laughs> what it is, but it, I think site should be S-I-G-H-T uh, rather than S-I-T-E. Yes. Um, because I think it's the voice and sight uh, rule that uh, Francis was talking about. Yep. Good, thank you. Any other proposed changes to page one? Seeing none, I will move to page two. Anything there? Uh, I see Karen. Yep, you're gonna have to unmute Karen. Um, in the second paragraph um, regarding the Rocky Mountain Greenways process, um, I thought it should say uh, Mark Gershman provided an update on the last few years. <clears throat> the, the last few years of activity? That's or... fine. Yep. Do you want to put that after the first sentence or? or? Yeah, at the end of that short paragraph or oh. that sentence, yeah. Okay, and then, so just say that again to Leah so we make sure she's got it. Mark Gershman provided an update on the last two few years of activity. She's smiling and nodding again. Thank you. Okay, anything else on page two? Okay, with those changes then, uh, I will uh, support a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. So moved, any second? Second. Okay, I'll call the roll. Hal Halstein, you're muted. Uh, I approve. Very good, Karen Holweg. Yes. Dave Kuntz. Yes. Caroline Miller. Yes. And I also vote yes. And so those minutes for the meeting of January 13th, 2021 are approved unanimously. <clears throat> Moving on to the next uh, item on the agenda. It is my honor and great privilege to read the commendation for Molly Davis. This commendation is to recognize the very special contributions to our community and our natural resources by Molly Davis, well-known Boulder artist, open space advocate and trustee and humanitarian. Following the devastating 2013 floods and in spite of suffering her own substantial losses, Molly set out to document the resiliency of our open space lands by carrying her easel and paints along our trails to every open space property, a project she called Every Trail. The resulting 225 pieces captured the beauty and the diversity of our open space lands in a major 2018 exhibition titled Open Space Visions, displayed at the Rembrandt Yard and also at the Boulder Museum and in Molly's associated book. 
Several of her paintings remain on display at the open space in Mountain Park's headquarters. Molly has conveyed her love of painting and open space to artists in Colorado nationally and internationally through numerous classes in plein air techniques and through her participation in many juried shows, both as an artist and as a volunteer judge. She has also long supported the OSMP youth art programs with both materials and her expertise. Serving on the Open Space Board of Trustees, Molly was a dedicated and tenacious advocate for the values in the Open Space Charter, a copy of which she often carried. She was not afraid to cast a vote of principal dissent, yet never let it affect her positive relations with and support for her fellow trustees. While on the board, she earned the nickname Do Davis for her due diligence and tenacity in evaluating every proposal, budget, and contract. No detail was left unexamined. And both as a trustee and later as a member of the public, she participated fully despite the increasing challenges with her voice. She gave countless hours to working with the public and the staff and studying issues across the open space system. Molly maintained and nurtured close connections with the first leaders of our open space programs, helping to bring a historic context and a continuity of vision into current open space policy and management. In this regard, it was fitting that Molly would chair the committee organizing the 2017 50th anniversary celebration of the passage of the first Boulder open space tax, marked with community engagements and events throughout that year. Molly participated in developing the first OSMP Agricultural Resources Management Plan, which brings specific and comprehensive guidance to managing our leased farms and ranch lands. Molly has long had a special connection to the agricultural community that maintains their historic stewardship of the ranches and farms which the open space program protected from development. She recognizes that sustaining these operations at the edge of growing urban areas is very challenging and she is a tireless advocate for the agricultural community and their role in open space stewardship. Molly's concern for those affected by the flooding has not been limited to Boulder. She has given considerable time, effort, and her resources to help the town of Princeville, North Carolina, a historic town founded by freed slaves that suffered catastrophic flooding in 2016 during a category five hurricane as they sought to rebuild their community. It is for these and her many other contributions to enriching our community and protecting our open space resources that the Open Space Board of Trustees, former trustees, and the leadership and staff of the Boulder Open Space and Mountain Parks Department extend our heartfelt thanks and appreciation to Molly Davis on this day, February 10th, 2021. And that is signed by the Boulder Open Space Board of Trustees, Kurt Brown, Hal Hallstein, Karen Holway, Dave Kuntz, Caroline Miller, and former trustees, Francis Hartog and Tom Isaacson, and the Open Space and Mountain Parks Department with Dan Burke, director, signing on behalf of the department staff. I also need to mention that uh, since this draft was published, uh, Alan Feinberg, a former trustee, has asked that her name be added to the final copy that's sent to Molly. Um, so again, our great appreciation to Molly for all she's done for open space. Um, yes, we have they're a here. Um, any trustees or Dan or other staff want to add any comments at this point, just raise your hand. Uh, I'll start with Caroline and then I got Dave next. Yeah, I just want to say before being on the board, um, I had met with Molly and she had done a lot and given a lot of her time to mentor me and really help me understand the agricultural department and community within open space. Um, and she was, um, you know, just beyond helpful and warm and, and open to um, teaching me all that she knew. So it's an honor to be able to call her a friend and to know her. Um, and, and I really appreciate, you know, everything that she has done for me um, in that regards to open space. Thank you, Caroline. Dave? 
Yeah, if memory serves, I think uh, Molly's first open space board meeting was actually the evening of the 2013 flood. Um, and it, it strikes me that uh, along a number of uh, threads in the tapestry of uh, the program, that that is one that we're still uh, weaving. And so uh, she's been very instrumental in a whole number of uh, open space issues, uh, that being one. And I think, you know, viable and sustainable communities really depend on community members like Molly. And she, she's kind of lives without a whole lot of fanfare, but her dogged determination to do the right thing, I think is um, a model for us all. And so thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Karen? And I, I just want to note that um, as far as I know, Molly is the first and so far only artist that we've had on the Open Space Board. And um, at the time I encouraged her to apply, I, I really thought it was important to bring that perspective to the board. And every time I hike up um, Goshawk Trail and I see the, the trail sign that she painted, um, the image for, for the entry to the habitat conservation area there, um, I think of her and all the wonderful contributions she made. And I fully subscribe to this commendation and, and again, thank her very much. Thanks, Molly. Uh, Dan, you're muted. Thank you, Kurt. Yeah, I just want to relay a quick story which sort of summarizes everything we've been talking about regarding Molly. But as, as all of you know, she's she has sort of a, a love for the rich history of this department um, and really uh, takes a lot of pride in, in helping other people understand that history. And within the first month of uh, uh, three years ago, almost now, uh, taking on this position, she arranged um, to for me to have a lunch with uh, uh, former director Jim Crane, as well as the former director of both Honey Parts and Open Space, um, Ron Stewart. And so we had a uh, over a two hour lunch that Molly, did and of course, had all the goodies for us and the lunch itself. And, and the whole purpose was just to sit around the table and talk. And um, that was one of my first introductories as far as the deep getting to understand the deep history from the perspectives of former directors and and um, and Molly was instrumental in putting that all together and again it would just speaks to you know her her love for this department the concept of open space protection and and the history so uh, thank you Molly for everything and for helping me understand um, our past and our history better so here here. Thank you, Dan. Okay, I think uh, we can go on to public comment. Uh, and so I'll check in again with Allison. Um, how many do we have signed up at this point, Allison? Well, we had one signed up. I don't see him on here though. So we do have one calling an iPhone. So if you are on an iPhone and you would like me to rename you so that you can unmute yourself to speak. You can text me 720-576-8593. So uh, text me your full name and I can rename you. Um, and then if you've joined the meeting and you would like to raise your hand to speak, you can hover, open your participants icon at the bottom and in that participants box, there will be a raise your hand button that you can click or sometimes now raise your hand is appearing in the reactions icon. So and then we have one hand raise and then we'll see if um, the person who signed up joins us as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Why don't we start okay. with uh, Lynn? Okay, so Lynn, um, you can go ahead and un unmute. Great, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yes. If it starts to get choppy, call me out at any moment. Um, I wanted to bring up 
this issue that now we're back to the um, 100 year variant one on CU South. And I'm highly recommending, and I thought, I thought this was going to be the case with this last year that we've been working on this issue um, of the upstream detention. That was a no-go from the start. I don't know how much money we spent on that, but it was a waste in my opinion. And I know that you didn't agree with me, Kurt, but I also think that the 100 year variant with any kind of dam or detention is the wrong way to go. And I'd say that we need an investigation on that unless somehow someone's gonna recommend to the um, council to direct the, um, the staff, Joe and, and um, Brian, <coughs> do a alternative six mitigation of this flow pattern. Um, I think there's this desperation to get a hundred year done and there doesn't need to be, that there can be a much better mitigation, 500 to a thousand with keeping the stream in the stream, diverting it South Boulder Creek into the main flow and taking it all, dredging it all the way out of town. That's gonna have much less effect on the natural space and the, um, the um, habitat in the long run, it's gonna be a much better option. And uh, dredging it down to any depth that you want, depending on how many years. And then you can also change that as you move along. If you want it 500 now, but you wanna make it a thousand later, you can dredge it deeper. And then build up the side with rocks and um, appropriately all the way out of town. And this is just the most intuitively thoughtful way to get this, this alluvium that we, unfortunately we have to change because people built in this land. And so we need to change it this way, not with dams that are gonna require a rebuilding and a lot of maintenance and have and have no variability in how many year flood you can uh, detain. And I don't think it should be a con it's a conflict of interest the way it is now between an annexation and mitigation. And you need to stand up for mitigation exclusive of annexation. Thanks. Thank you, Lynn. Allison, where are we with the uh, other member of the public? I'm not seeing him. Okay. I don't think he's joined us and I don't see any other hands raised. Okay. Well, then that uh, closes the public comment period. And next we'll move on to matters of the department. Uh, Dan, go right ahead. Yeah, thanks, Kurt. Uh, tonight we've got uh, a couple of items under matters that uh, we'll be presenting. Uh, the first is we're going to be presenting um, um, uh, phase one results of the parking study. Uh, then we're going to talk uh, uh, about uh, the 10-year planning horizon uh, as far as our first step of reaching out to the board on our OSMP's planning framework. Uh, I'll have some, a couple of brief uh, um, verbal updates. Uh, so that's what matters looks like tonight. And we're going to start things off with Anna Reed who's going to uh, provide you all with a presentation of our 2019-2020 parking study, phase one results. So with that, I'll turn things over to Anna. Great, thank you, Dan. And I'm excited to have my first presentation with you all. Share my screen. All right. So thank you everyone for being here this evening. Um, as Dan mentioned, my name is Anna Reed and I'm a human dimensions analyst with City of Boulder Open Space and Mountain Parks. Uh, this presentation is on the 2019-2020 parking study, which represents phase one of a two-phase study to better understand how OSMP trailhead lots are utilized. 
As mentioned in the memo, this presentation will expand on written information provided for the January OSBT meeting and will provide opportunity for questions and feedback. And Anna, it's not showing up if you've already projected it. Just it's not. Let's see, the screen two. Oh, because I have to hit share. There you go. We see it. Perfect. You may want to enlarge it. There we go. How about now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. You've got you've got your notes showing on the right panel. I don't know if you want to have it oh, in that view. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Share screen. Screen. Mm to share. All right. Perfect. There we go. All right. Third time's the charm. All right. Okay. So to outline what we'll be covering, we'll start with a background and overview of the study and then take a high level look at, of, a high level look of methods, results, next steps and followed by potential applications and questions at the end. All right, so some background. The need for this study extends back at least to the 2005 visitor master plan, which brought up concerns about parking and congestion at various trailheads. Um, more recently, these issues have reemerged and have been confirmed with COVID-19 and areas of concern include congestion, safety, parking availability and equity, increased visitor use, and social ecological capacity. And linking it to our master plan strategies listed here, um, parking for the most part fits pretty solidly in the responsible recreation, stewardship, and enjoyment focus area, namely assess and manage increasing visitation, encourage multimodal access to trailheads, and develop a learning laboratory approach to recreation. It also supports communication with visitors and helps inform our facilities and services delivery. And we can even argue that it extends beyond these. So assuming we can use the data presented here to encourage multimodal access to trailheads and reduce vehicle arrivals, we can start to get into the realm of reducing the greenhouse gas em emissions and addressing the climate crisis. So this is all to say that parking is often a major part of the visitor experience and has many applications looking forward. So here's an overview of the parking study as a whole. The objective of phase one is to obtain baseline occupancy data of 34 OSMP managed trailhead lots. So these 34 lots make up all of OSMP's formal parking areas on OSMP property. Um, all of them except for 4th of July trailhead simply because of its distance. Um, and we had to draw the line somewhere. So it excludes neighborhood parking and other areas where parking overflows to areas not on OSMP property. From this phase, we can obtain information such as when and how frequently lots reach capacity and as a result, we can learn when that overflow might be happening. The objective of phase two is to understand the primary contributors of congestion at six busier lots. So essentially, why do busier lots reach capacity so frequently? We know some locations are simply popular, but we still haven't quantified some related aspects such as turnover, parking duration, and number of people per, per vehicle. This information will all be very important if we decide to pursue a management action down the road. And here at the bottom, you can see a timeline of the study. We started installing equipment and piloting in 2019 and started official data collection in June 2019. We intended to have a full year of data, but with COVID, um, we have more opportunistic data from March 2020 on. We were able to continue collecting data at some sites, but not all of them. Phase two is planned to start later this year and will be completed by the end of the year. We'll share a compiled report for both phases in early 2022, but we'll of course have phase one data before then, such as what I'm gonna share in a couple minutes. 
So phase one methods. The fun thing about OSMP trailheads is they're all different shapes and sizes. So it's really not feasible to use the same approach for all locations. The most straightforward way to count the number of vehicles in a lot is to use the vehicle counter. Um, so we installed these where we could. Um, this has to do with the layout and composition of the access road. At other locations, we installed trail counters and took advantage of some already installed for our long-term monitoring. We did a fair amount of piloting to confirm that we could reliably get parking data from these trail counts. For all these locations with trail and vehicle counters, we also did direct observations. So this means going to the trailhead and counting the number of vehicles parked there. So this stands alone as a pretty reliable data set and also helps us to validate and analyze the other methods. And finally, we installed cameras um, at sites to basically fill in the gaps um, where it wasn't realistic to install vehicle counters or trail counters. Uh, for most of these, the layout doesn't work for vehicle counters, again, based on the access road and trail counts cannot be reliably correlated with the number of vehicles parked in the lot. Um, we see this, for example, at Buckingham Park, where there are multiple trails from different corners of the lot. Another example includes many of the pull-off parking lots off of Flagstaff, where visitors disperse or don't even go on a trail after parking. So there's a few different methods going on, but despite having these different methods, they can all boil down to a common data set. So between cameras and observations, we cover all of the trailhead lots, and from that, we have a good data set of occupancy descriptive stats. The downside is we're limited to the dates and times we are able to get out there and when we had cameras up. Vehicle counters, once installed and running, collect inbound and outbound data 24 seven. Um, so in addition to the occupancy stats, we can get a sense of the hourly vehicle arrivals and departures, for example. For trail counters, we pair trail count data with our observations to give us a percent occupancy predictive model. Um, so a little farther removed, but we're still getting good data from those. Um, and again, a few different methods, but they can essentially all boil down to occupancy data um, with some opportunities for higher resolution information depending on the method that we used. Moving right along to results, the, the fun part. There's a few things going on in this table, so I'll spend a couple minutes here. Um, all the data here is from our observation and camera data, so essentially our eyes on the ground for the number of vehicles parked. The estimated capacity was almost its own mini project. Um, it's straightforward in some lots. It's simply the number of delineated standard spaces. Um, but especially in our natural surface lots, the effective capacity can range by quite a lot, depending on how people park and lots of other factors. These numbers represent how many standard size vehicles could typically and legally park in each lot, um, but there can, of course, be some variation. The hours you see there um, are from 9 a.m. through 4 p.m. We have data outside of these hours, but with camera and observation data, reducing to these hours was the most straightforward way and most reliable way to compare all the sites to each other. And then you can see we have the column of averages. That's the average for those hours, and that's what all the locations are sorted by. And then we have the averages for weekdays and weekends. And the colors you can see range from orange to green to blue with the average percent occupancies. So some examples of at least what I found interesting, uh, Chautauqua and Settlers Park have similar levels of occupancy regardless of weekday or weekend. Um, Chautauqua is a bit busier on weekends, um, but having an average in the 90s is pretty impressive regardless. A Centennial parking lot is pretty full on weekends at 90% occupancy, but on average for these hours, it's about two thirds full during the week. You can see some larger gaps by weekday and weekend at sites like Realization Point, South Mesa, Boulder Valley Ranch, and Eagle. You can also see interesting differences by time of day. 
For example, Dry Creek and Flatter and Vista are busier earlier in the day, and Lost Gulch starts getting busier in the afternoon. So there's a lot of information to tease out of this table. Um, it's not all the data we have. Again, we have data outside these hours and we can split out hours by weekday and weekend, but we thought it was a nice and easy visual way to compare all the different locations to each other. We also developed a heat map to visualize the data and as a helpful way to look at the supply and, the, and demand spatially across the system and to see how percent occupancy relates to parking lot size or capacity. So here, the larger circles represent a larger sized lot and the darker purple color represents higher average percent occupancy. So some examples here, we can see areas around the system where the average percent occupancies are higher. Um, for example, where we might expect in the West um, we can also see areas like Teller North and South have relatively larger lots and lower average occupancies, and sites like Bob Blink and Dry Creek have relatively smaller lots and higher average percent occupancies. All right, next steps. So the data shown here, data shown here really just scratches the surface of what we collected, and there's a lot more coming. With additional analysis, we can start looking at monthly variations, hours outside of the 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and night use. We can look at COVID impacts at sites where we have that available data, horse trailer use, and other examples. Reporting, um, we're working on a technical report that will be released soon, and that will have more of the site-specific data. Um, more exciting is we want to make the data more publicly available. So this could look like an interactive platform or some way for people to view and interact with the data. We also want to combine it with other data sets, namely trail counters and surveys. Uh, this can help us answer questions such as how does occupancy relate to visitor experiences? How does it relate to residency? and to what extent, extent does a full lot impact visitation numbers on the trail. We're also planning to continue collecting data where feasible and where we have more permanent infrastructure installed. Um, what we have here is a static data set, but we have the potential to share not live data, but data that's updated more regularly for some sites. So that's in the works. And we have phase two. So again, um, we're planning to start data collection later this year, and the variables that we're interested in include how long vehicles are parked, how frequently they're getting turned away, and the number of single occupancy vehicles, as well as some other things. And the locations that we're planning to, to look at are Centennial, South Mesa, Dowdy Draw, Settlers Park, Bob Link, and Flatirons Vista. These are all sites that are towards the higher end of the table for higher average occupancies, and they represent a diversity of locations that could be reaching capacity for different reasons. As a whole, this will allow us to further evaluate what is going on when lots are full. Potential applications. So there's a lot of potential ways that we can use information gathered in this study. Some examples range from helping visitors plan trips, informing staff of when lots are likely overflowing and when illegal parking is occurring, and help us collaborate more with transportation and community vitality when overflow impacts do occur. We could also, it could also help us answer emerging questions, um, such as better understanding COVID impacts to visitation. Uh, the data shown here is from before those impacts, so a next step is looking at how things have changed. Um, it could also help us answer how much our, our horse trailer and ADA accessible spaces used, and where and when do we see the most night use, and how does lot size relate, relate to trail use. And finally, management strategies. Um, which ones are feasible, and where and when would they be most effective? The intent of the study was to collect baseline data and serve as a starting point for discussions down the road. 
Um, it will help us to be better prepared and better able to measure trends and effects of any management actions that we want to explore. And it will help us prioritize where and when to focus our efforts. So now on knowledge, acknowledgements, I think as was mentioned before, it was a big study and I want to particularly thank the human dimensions team, um, which is listed here. Dion, Colin, and Heidi for guidance and logistics, Dominic, Libby, Katie, and Pete, who helped with data collection at one time or another during the study period. And many others also helped. Um, we had trailhead closures, signage, science, science review. So a big thanks goes out to all of them. And finally, questions and any feedback on potential applications or anything else. Try to stop sharing. Okay, raise your hand if you have a question here. Hal. Um, first off, thank you for the presentation. I found that really fascinating, um, particularly the data rich piece. And um, it may have been just been my eye, but one thing that seems clear is that our users don't siesta. The high middle of the, <laughs> the, high middle of the day is, is the moment. Um, my question is about uh, parking surfaces. It's my recollection that we do have a collection of lots that include both dirt surfaces and also paved surfaces. And I'm wondering if you have done any look at correlation between uh, parking lot use and surface type, i.e. that people are, are more apt to drive into paved parking areas. No, that's an interesting question. And that's honestly something I haven't thought of yet, but that's something we can definitely do. And, okay, and, and, and then I guess the other thing I would add on that, I'd, I'd be personally interested to know if the usage of square footage is materially different in paved lots with lines versus unlined dirt lots. Basically, car actual realized car density by surface type? That's an interesting question too. Yeah, so if there's no delineated lines, do vehicles kind of tend to cram in more or park further apart from each other? Yeah, yeah, that's great. And I guess the third leg of that, maybe this is more of a question for Dan perhaps. Um, what, can you explain how it comes to be that we have a paved lot as opposed to a dirt one and how all that works regarding the charter, et cetera? Yeah, that's really interesting. In fact, um, I was out on the system with Steve Armstead last week and um, we were at uh, Four Mile Creek and with a paved lot. And I asked Steve, I said, how did this get to be paved? Uh, so I don't know, Steve, if you're on the call, if, if maybe you have more history on uh, how lots got to be paved, but uh, that, uh, uh, that anecdote that you told me about that particular parking lot was interesting. Yeah, sure. I can just say, I think now having just heard Anna and thinking about this, we have the four mile and then of course Chautauqua, which are the two paved, but those are primarily because they're inside the city limits and they fall under city code for paving, whereas a predominance of our uh, parking lots are outside the city limits and therefore they are not subject to the city code and we can have mm -hmm of surfaces for those. And I think that's why you typically have the road base or a gravel surface in the majority of those. And the Flagstaff yeah. Summit, I guess would be the other example of a paved and that was originally not paved, um, but I think with the wear and tear because of the mountain and the level of traffic up there, it eventually was paved to, to help harden the surface. So, so the ones in the city, you couldn't remove the pavement even if you wanted to. I think that may be the case, but I would I would I can't say I'm up to snuff on the current code requirement. Okay. Certainly, it was applicable when we put those trailheads in. That Jim may even know more factual what we currently stand, but I think that would be something we'd have to be compliant with the current code conditions. Yeah. Isn't One of the lake being another example. Yep. Oh yes. Yep. I'm sorry, Dan. Could you say that again? Yeah. No. Wonderland Lake, another example of a paved one, is within the city limits. And Settlers Park? 
Mm. <laughs> yeah. Dave, Coots. Yeah, Anna, thanks for that. That was uh, very interesting and uh, I think long overdue. Uh, the, my comment is uh, regarding the history of parking areas on the system. And I think it's worth, uh, you know, the department acknowledging that historically, the, the reason for many of the lots and the shape they're in is basically it was trying to replicate a ranch corral. And, and so early on when uh, the access issue wasn't as prevalent and you know the, the parking demand was, was certainly uh, far less than it is today, that was basically it. I think uh, the, the intent system-wide was to you know, maintain a Western flavor for you know, access to, um, to the system. And combining that with uh, the reg boards and the information boards, uh, which reflected more of a national park kind of um, uh, information or, or trailhead setting, um, those were, I think, the two main issues uh, related to um, uh, trailhead parking. So now I think you were asking about applications. Now the, the fact of the matter is, is that do those you know, parking areas actually function uh, under the current circumstances. And I think uh, more recently we've seen, uh, you know, the Flatirons Vista, for example, is a, is a good example of a parking area that uh, was, was reconfigured and, and reconstructed to be uh, more efficient and more flexible and to appeal to, uh, to different users, i.e horse trailer parking um, specifically. But anyway, historically, I think we should acknowledge that most of those trailheads were, you know, tr trying to reflect the more Western heritage and were just basically corral rectangles, quite frankly, and uh, whether they had much, um, much uh, benefit for access uh, probably wasn't uh, an issue that was uh, considered important then. <laughs> Other thoughts? I see Darren. <laughs> I just popped on. Hi, everybody. Darren Wagner. Uh, you know, uh, the conversation is just so interesting to me. I appreciate how the direction has gone because you're bringing up some questions that staff have been uh, talking about lately as it relates to the aesthetics and functionality of our parking lots, our trailheads, our facilities. And Dave, you're absolutely right. You know, our conversation is largely trying to respond to the landscape character and the history of the site. Um, I was just recollecting a, when I worked at the National Park Service, we had a consultant try and propose a design for us as we were expanding parking uh, at Bryce Canyon that looked much like something that you'd see in front of Walmart. And um, that didn't go over so well with us. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we have a lot to balance in terms of efficiency, but also character and, and experience. So uh, it, it's, it's something that we're certainly looking at. Other thoughts, folks? So, Carolyn, I see your hand up, and then I've got Caroline. Um, at, in the conclusion part of your report, you say uh, that uh, the data will be instrumental in determining how to maintain positive visitor experiences while sustaining ecosystem health. Um, can you give me a couple examples of that in terms of what you do and how you're focusing on things? Sure, um, I think part of what I was thinking of writing that is we'll have to think about the social and ecological capacity if, you know, if we want to do any management actions down the road. And part of what we're doing with our surveys is kind of keeping a pulse on visitor experience, experiences. Um, so we asked them about, we asked them to rate different things about parking, um, if it was difficult or easy to find a spot and that type of thing. Um, and we're going to ask more about crowding. And so part of what I think we're intending to do is kind of keep tabs on that. And then for each location, you know, ideally we'll, we'll have a sense of our, um, like our, kind of our, our vision for the area and what, um, use will look like and again what the ecology will look like and see if it makes sense to 
either expand parking, reduce parking, facilitate people getting there um, with a shuttle. Um, I think thinking of the social and ecological parts will just help us figure out what we want to do down the road. And others feel free to jump in. And that goes, that goes along with um, statements like that this is not directly linked to any uh, plan management actions. So I understand that. I, for my um, perspective, my biggest question is, can we sustain the ecosystem's health with more visitors? So I would flip the question and say, you know, before I'm going to be amenable to expanding parking or increasing numbers of people at any trailhead, I'm going to want you to come to me and say, this is the status of the ecosystem health for this part of the system. And therefore, we don't think or we do think that we can accommodate more visitors. So I, I would encourage you to keep that in mind as you move forward. If for me, it's not how many people we can stack into any given trailhead. It's what is, what is the status of the system's ecosystem health and, um, and therefore, can the system in this part withstand more visitors? Sure. Yeah, I think that's definitely something to consider with it and limiting and I'm, parking. And I'm sure your human dimension staff have a lot of ways that they can look at all sorts of data and determine that first before we have a conversation about parking lots further. Mm -hmm. uh, Darren? Uh, thanks, Kurt. I was just going to say you'll notice that there's a, a nice logic to the order of the presentations tonight because we'll just dip into this a bit, Karen, as we start talking about what our next uh, planning efforts may look like. Okay, I've got Caroline and then Dave. Dave, was your comment like uh, kind of a colloquy off of Karen? Did you want to throw something in there with her comment? <laughs> yeah, actually, it was, but yeah, uh, yeah. Go ahead. I can wait. <laughs> no, no, go ahead, please. I'll go after you. So just uh, piggybacking on Karen's comment uh, a little, Anna, I, and Darren, I, uh, I, I'm a little concerned about, and you referenced this a couple of times in, in um, your presentation, the use of the term social slash ecological capacity, where it relates to parking lots or trailhead parking. So I would strongly urge that you do two things. One is separate those out because they are definitely not the same and be a little more specific because I think as Karen is mentioning, we're talking about the ecological health of the system or certainly the area and, and without kind of that more definitive description, you're sitting there wondering, well, what ecological capacity does a parking lot have? You know, and I think what you what we're what we're trying to do is say, look, um, you know, parking areas uh, can certainly uh, influence or impact, you know, what happens out on the system. And so my recommendation is to, you know, pay, is to not use that those terms, um, you know, kind of together and separate them out a little and be a, a little more specific on exactly the relationship of trailhead parking to both what Karen is talking about is visitor use or capacity and also ecosystem health. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's fair, thank you. <laughs> okay, Caroline. Hey, well, thank you for your presentation, Anna. And I'm so excited to hear that you were excited to present for us to come and hang out with us. And that was exciting for you. So <laughs> thank you for saying that. Um, we're excited to have you. And uh, just so I don't forget, um, Dave, thank you for that information that, that you gave um, with the corral rectangles. It's just nice to hear that kind of history and, and have all of that put together. So that was neat. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so Anna, uh, I heard you say a couple of things that I thought was um, interesting. One of them was, how does a full lot impact use on the trail? And when you said that, my immediate thought went to, 
you know, someone going for a hike, they pull up, the parking lot's full, where do they go next? Where mm -hmm. are their next spots? Do they have like a top three? And then after that, they, they simply give up and, and try to, you know, head out earlier the next day. Um, are, are you guys, while you might not be able to, to give any info or present on that tonight, are, is, is that kind of a, an idea of what you guys are trying to track in, in, in that way? Yeah, that's a, it's a hard thing to answer because once they, they can't find a spot, we're not able to survey them. Yeah. We have in the past asked people if they weren't able to find a parking spot, where did they go? Um, and in some cases at like Centennial or Chautauqua, a lot of times I'll just say, well, the same lot, I'll just, you know, park in the neighborhood or I'll, you know, I'll find some other spot. Um, at places like South Mesa or Dowdy Draw, that's not as much of an option. And so we've, we've tried to capture some of that. Um, again, it's hard. Um, in an upcoming survey effort, we're going to be asking people where they were before they came to the trailhead. So that will help us capture if they tried to get to a lot or you know go to a different trailhead, weren't able to find a spot, where, where did they come from? And then hopefully we'll be able to learn more about that. Um, yeah, but that's, that is a tricky one. And it's something that we, we often think about. Yeah. And then um, the other thing that I heard you say, I just didn't know if you had um, any additional detail um, was helping them plan the trips. And in my head, when, when you said that, I'm like, there's an app for that. Um, you know, I just, I, I think it's such a great idea and again, tricky in, in how to execute something like that. But are, are you able with the with um, the data that you're collecting from the way that you're doing it to um, really find a way to be able to help them plan? So like you could tell people ahead of time, you know, we'll save you the time and energy if you're not at this lot by 9 a.m. You know, we've been been recording this for a year and we can pretty much tell you unless you're coming in when someone's going out, you're not going to have, you know, a good chance. Are you able to do things like that with the, with the data? Yeah, I, I think we can. Um, we'll definitely want to keep tabs on how use changes because um, of course it, you know, it's it shifted around a bit with COVID. But with the data set that we have, um, I know other places like Boulder County will have, like this is what parking tends to look like. And so we can have kind of like the, what you see on like Google Maps, you'll see like what use tends to look like. And that could at least help people so they could know like, okay, if I'm trying to go to, to this lot at this time on this day, I probably will have trouble finding a spot. Okay, great. And then um, for me, my time at the trails is pretty early when I head out, um, I, you know, who doesn't love a sunrise up high. So I actually will come down a lot, um, you know, right after sunrise and um, you know, the, the city of Boulder seems to get up and moving pretty early. So mm -hmm. the stuff that you showed today was from 9 a.m., but I, I am a part of the group that is out in the trails hours before 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. So it would be really interesting to see um, if you had that data, you know, like for example, um, mm -hmm. are people at Wonderland Lake, um, you know, is that parking lot really getting filled at, at 6 a.m.? Um, you know, versus, uh, you know, other, other places, like how, how are those looking a bit earlier? I just, I would be interested in the data for that sunrise hour and seeing um, how that goes, you know, because Shanahan, I'll come down, you know, 45 minutes after sunrise and it is like packed. So, um, so yeah, so just kind of knowing those like early hours too, and where those seem to fill up, I, I'd be, um, I'd be interested to know more. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely share more of the, the site specific data when, when we have it. And that will include stuff like that. We see some really interesting things. Like we can see the before and after work places yeah. and where we see the kind of dips like that, or like in the summer when it's really hot, we'll see the different dips where it's busier earlier and later in the day. So that's definitely coming. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Other questions or thoughts? Yeah, Kurt, uh, Colin yeah. Leslie has, has had his hand up. I'm wondering if he has Great. anything he wants to add. Uh, sure. I was uh, 
It was just when uh, both uh, you, Karen, and Dave were were talking about the interplay between sort of social dynamics and then understanding the logical functioning of the area too. Um, I think, as probably all of us know, it's th that's sort of the million dollar question, right? And the big challenge, really, you know, with with this data collection, with a lot of the work we're doing with trail counters, what we're trying to get at is to sort of understand the functioning of those systems or of, of particularly the visitation system. So that even if it, you know, takes us a long time to answer that million dollar question, the more pieces we can understand and when we proposals come up and we're running through scenario analyses and saying, well, if we, if we, you know, put pressure here, what happens, right, in terms of the visitation system. So that's really sort of where we're at is um, putting all these pieces together is to try and give us an understanding of sort of how at least the visitation system works in and of itself. So that if we do, right, try and make those tweaks, we can have a little bit of um, heads up about what, how we might expect things to respond. I think we also know, as this, this board has discussed several times over the last year, that the system is really getting degraded by some of the heavy use. And, and so in my opinion, I think we need to hit head on the question of where is the degradation happening and where is the heavy use and I think those two things coincide, but I may be wrong. Um, and, and therefore, where are we damaging the system more than we're enhancing visitor use? So I don't think we can deal with just visitor use by itself. And, and I keep wondering whether the human dimensions staff is, is collecting and looking at and analyzing some of the important data about the ecological systems. Uh, in this case, we were looking to work closely with our ecologists in in beginning to to bring together those data, you know, down the road. So, yeah, Colin, I will simply say that the. Con the, a cautionary note, the concern I have is that I think in, in, in the relative sense, the social data that is recreation, economic, are, are far easy, more easily measured than the ecological uh, data collection. And I just uh, don't want us to kind of put all the uh, proverbial eggs in that basket just because you know, we can- It's easy to count. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I think my recommendation would be to, to err on the, uh, on the other side and make sure that we're getting the, the best and most complete, accurate and comprehensive uh, ecological information that we can. Has anybody uh, either in the human dimension staff or uh, any, any of your, your uh, staff, OSMP staff, Dan, uh, looked at, for instance, the status of the HCA acreage and where we're losing um, the highest quality habitat that we've designated HCA? Yeah, so, um, and John Potter or um, um, Brian Anniker, Heather, if you're on the line, you can jump in on this one too, but I know that uh, we are planning to bring forward, uh, we haven't quite pigeoned it in as far as when exactly in 2021, uh, we want to bring out some ecological data, um, but we do have um, um, that as an agenda item that we're looking for for the back half of 2021 to look at some of the data sets that we have on our uh, collection of, of ecologically based data. Uh, but not, John, I don't know if you want to add anything to that or Brian Anneker or yeah, Dan. Um, yeah, really, uh, we, we don't have a strong feeling that there's degradation occurring in HCAs. In fact, um, while there might have been some increased incursions uh, due to COVID, which we did uh, let you guys know about 
somewhat uh, recently, uh, we really don't see it as uh, impacting the overall health of the HCAs in any significant long-term way. That's not what uh, we've been observing. We have um, also asked uh, um, Dion and uh, Heather to start to put their heads together about how can we start to bring these data sets together, the information that we have on the ecological monitoring with the information that um, Dion and Colin and Anna have been developing on the uh, human dimension side. So that's really the cutting edge, of course, the trick, the challenge will be being able to draw um, strong conclusions about um, you know what what the what the causation of an impact is and that's going to be um, something that is relatively expensive to really tease out um, definitively but what it can do is to start to give us some sense of what might be going on so that is our hope and and a direction that um, staff will be continuing to explore well and the, yeah. the off trail use um that that promotes fragmentation of habitat. Um, my anecdotal evidence says that when people feel like the trails are too crowded, they take off and make their own trail and go their own way. And that that is not advantageous to the ecosystem. Yeah. Um... I think, as you know, we also have a, a project in uh, reducing undesignated trails, and um, the, that that is uh, also being done in a prioritized fashion to address just what you're after. Dion, did you have something to add? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, I did want to say thanks to Anna. Um, this was her first big project for Open Space and Mountain Parks. I'm really proud of all the work that she did going into this big of a data set for 34 of our lots. It's just amazing to us all. We're happy to share tonight. And then getting back to the ecological human dimensions question, I just wanted to reiterate that uh, H, the human dimensions team me measures the human component on the system. All of the ecological data would come from our ecology staff. And I think as John just mentioned, it is one of our aspirations to start lining up now that we have parking data, we're starting to have long-term trail counting data. We have Trendable visitor survey, including all the attributes of you know, who's coming, we can start to overlay them on top of each other and figure out if there's any relationships there between type, uh, type of use, level of use, distribution across the system and the health of the ecological resources. But we don't manage the ecological data. We would provide um, our part. Overlay yeah, we're, 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 all, we're all aware of human dimensions being separate from the ecology staff. But I just think that 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 one can't operate without the other. Otherwise, we don't have an open space system that's worth preserving. C correct. And um, as um, we'll go ahead, Dan. Oh, I was just going to say, as Anna showed in that application slide. Um, the intention there for integrating with other data sets, of course, is gonna be trail, trail condition, any, any data set, any type of resource that we manage, including you know, infrastructure, parking, visitor experience, the recreation resources, um, you know, vegetation, anything that we're concerned with. Um, as we develop this comprehensive look at what's going on recreationally, we can understand them in relation to the condition of other types of resources that we manage. Thanks, Kurt. Um, Anna, one last thing that just uh, occurred to me in this discussion, you uh, discussed that you're gonna collect data on single occupancy vehicles, which I think is a very interesting data set. Um, it sounds like you guys have a lot on your plate already, but if there's any way for us to look within that group, how many of those people are walking dogs? I'd be very interested in that because it's not really possible to ride a bike with you know, to go walk a dog, nor is it e really that feasible to use public transportation. And so I'd be really interested to see if we found some correlation in that area. I don't know if it's practical or possible, but I I'd love to know more about that. Sure, yeah, we're, we're gonna be doing some piloting soon. And my, my gut is that might be a little too much to collect with this one, but that is 
data that we collect through surveys and we um, through other observations. And so we can still pair it with different sites and get a sense of how many people are arriving with, with dogs. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so how, if you have um, access to the 2016, 2017 report on our website, mm -hmm. that particular piece of information you can find in the app appendix uh, table D28. Wow, great. <laughs> I'm going to make a note of that right now. And that'll be something that we'll repeat, as Anna mentioned, in our upcoming visitor survey, which we do every five years. So last conducted in 2016, 2017, until we launched again this summer. OK. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no quick brief on the finding for us right now, is there? Were you looking for who arrives in the car versus walks by activity types, such as a dog walker? Um, yeah, I was, was looking to see if there's a relationship between single op occupancy vehicles and dog walking. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I thought you meant um, arriving by car just in general. So scratch what I just said about <laughs> table D28 is looking at mode of arrival, including vehicle transport by oh. primary activity. So you can see the breakout of dog walkers that came by car versus walk versus run, you know, bike other. Great, that'll be very interesting too. That's a great clarification, thank you. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if we've done that particular cross tabs yet, but we can do who, who visited by themselves and came in a vehicle and had a dog. Okay. <laughs> At least system-wide, we can get that information. And then this next year, we'll have a better idea of more site-specific. Thank you. Differences. You're muted, Kurt. Oh, sorry. Any other comments, folks, before we uh, let these folks go? Well, Anna and the rest of the staff, thank you very much. You can see it's of great interest to uh, the board, and we look forward to learning more. So thank you. And Dan, back to you. Yeah, thanks. And thanks, Anna. Congratulations. <laughs> And uh, Karen, um, we have our agenda setting meeting that we take a look, you know, months ahead and now we'll uh, pay a particular attention to some of that uh, ecological data uh, and, and when we thought we would have uh, be ready to present some things on that. So that'll be top of my mind when we look ahead. <coughs> um, yeah, so next we are going to go into the next item, which is our first step uh, on our 10 year outlook for the OSMP planning framework and looking forward to tonight. And um, I'm gonna be joined a little bit later by uh, Mark Davison and Darren Wagner who will actually take the bulk of the specific presentation on, on the first step of, of looking at the uh, big major planning efforts. Um, so uh, look forward to that. But I, I do wanna spend about five or 10 minutes providing some context that I think would be helpful uh, for our presentation tonight and, uh, and actually just setting context in general, even in context setting for when Lauren starts to come forward and presenting uh, budget and, and those type of items as well. So um, bear with me uh, for a little context setting and uh, Darren, if we can go to the next slide. So tonight will be our first touch with the board with regards to the master plan strategy uh, under the financial sustainability uh, focus area of update our planning uh, framework. Um, we have several objectives that we hope to achieve tonight. Um, and they include uh, explaining and describing our proposed timeline and sequencing of a few new major planning initiatives that staff is envisioning initiating and completing over the course of the 10 year master plan time horizon. Uh, we'll be referring to these major planning initiatives as big lifts. So uh, you'll hear that term in somebody, uh, uh, you might, might wanna have a guessing game, but I would, I would guess it at least a couple dozen times tonight. Uh, so another objective tonight is to provide the board with a definition of what it means when we say a big lift, um, to describe the organizational capacity required to initiate and complete a big lift, and why big lifts impact our ability to simultaneously implement other high priority and necessary projects and actions. 
And finally, uh, what we hope to achieve tonight is to summarize some next steps for continuing our discussion with the board on updating OSMP's planning framework. So Darren, if we can go to the next slide. So, but before launching into the specific presentation on the topic of big lifts, um, I thought it would first be helpful to again, to describe and summarize the components and the aspects and the considerations that go into developing our annual work plan and in turn to inform our annual budget. And if we start here, this will help us to illustrate uh, why it is necessary and, and important that we take a very intentional, deliberate and strategic approach to when we schedule in big lifts into our work plans and budgets. So I'm gonna spend the next few minutes kind of describing components of our annual work plan to set the uh, stage for uh, how we sort of funnel in uh, the sequencing of the big lifts. First though, before we begin developing the specifics of what goes into an annual work plan, we uh, staff reviews and considers and we're ever mindful of the high level guidance that we get from the open space purposes in our charter, the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan and guidance of course from our, our recently approved master plan with a particular focus on tier one strategies over the next couple of years. So in addition to this high level guidance, annual work plan items um, uh, annual work plans are identified and prioritized based on the need and benefit to implement actions and recommendations that were called for in already completed and approved plans. Uh, one might think of trail study areas, uh, the grassland plan, the forest ecosystem management plan. Uh, more recently, we have the preferred alternative for managing uh, prairie dogs and soil health in irrigated agricultural lands. And of course we have site plans. Uh, you can think of one of the lake and the gun barrel hill complex recently. So there's a number of actions that are called for in those plans that feed into our annual work planning. Annual work plans also include ongoing projects and maintenance. And these are actions we tend to take on annually as, as part of our core work. And uh, these type of annual sort of ongoing actions include weed management, our agricultural leasing program, monitoring efforts, trail, trailhead and sign maintenance. Uh, you can think of facility and fleet maintenance. All those things are in terms of our core annual work. Also included in annual work plans are ongoing community services that we provide. Think of ranger patrol and projects. Think of educational programming such as uh, voice and sight classes, for example. Uh, we consider and uh, if appropriate, we distribute and give out permits and licenses. Uh, and there's a host of other community service type of activities uh, that we build into our work plans uh, every year. Annual work plans also account for the capacity needed to provide the department with operational administrative support. You can think of the support services we get from our real estate services staff or our information and technology staff folks or those staff members that are working in our financial and personnel services. All those have discrete projects and ongoing projects that are built into our work plans. Another component is citywide and regional projects and initiatives that our staff needs to be involved in and that are reflected in our annual work plans. Current examples that come to mind are projects such as the South Boulder Creek flood mitigation work, uh, the citywide equity initiative, tribal relations, fire mitigation planning and implementation, drought preparedness, planning and execution, regional trails, issues, even issues around homelessness and encampments, partnering on youth programming and education, volunteerism, really the, uh, the list goes on in terms of, we of course have our own component of that, but in the context of citywide and even regional um, lifts and efforts. And finally, the annual work plan also must account for emergent or unplanned work that always unexpectedly, yet not surprisingly, comes our way each and every year. Uh, in 2020, uh, of course, it's really easy to think about the two big ones of emergent unexpected work that came about, which is responding to the COVID crisis and forest fires. And I undoubtedly left some things off that go into our work plan, but I wanted to begin tonight's conversation and presentation by summarizing all these aspects and components 
that comprise the annual work plan because with so much breadth and diversity of our projects and services, it is challenging yet so important that we be balanced and that we're ever mindful of our organizational capacity so that we are able to deliver our services and actions at a very high level and in a manner that does not burn out our staff, that doesn't jeopardize our financial sustainability or even overburden the board council and the community, especially when it comes to large engagement projects. So this is the overall context in which we approach the work of identifying what big planning lists would be the most helpful to staff and moving the master plan implementation forward in the coming years and sequencing out over the next 10 years, the big priority planning lists OSMP, OSMP plans to embark on. And this is also the overall context in which we are now identifying and sequencing out other significant planning efforts that really might not quite rise to the level of definition to be considered a big lift, but are nonetheless demanding of organizational capacity. And we will bring more information back later this year on our, on our approach to these other aspects, as well as our latest thinking on the best approach for how we do plans for the department in the, uh, moving forward so that, that we can continue to improve to make sure they're more efficient and they're more effective. But as far as tonight, we're gonna focus on the big lifts. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over, I believe first to Mark Davison, and then we'll turn things over to Darren Wagner. So I think we can go to the next slide and bring on Mark. Thank you, Dan, and thanks for the context setting tonight. Yes, uh, it's Mark Davison, Community Connections and Partnerships Manager. And I'm just going to do um, a very brief introduction tonight. I'll talk a little bit about the agenda in the moment. And then I'll be passing it over to Darren Wagner, our Planning Design Supervisor, to lead you through the main content that we're going to talk about tonight. I think just um, to set us up, if you remember going back to the master plan, the board members who have participated in that, we did, as part of the effort to do the master plan, talk about the planning framework and the approach. And we said we'd be coming back to the board with details on that. And this tonight is the beginning of that conversation. I'll chat about the strategy that Dan touched on, FS10, updating the planning framework, just in terms of describe some of the thinking behind it and how we focused on it in terms of what led to the big lifts. Darren herself will dive into the, what those big lifts might look like, uh, the organization, organizational capacity required to achieve them. And then we just wondered what we want. One thing we wanted to be clear on, like I mentioned earlier, this is the beginning of the conversation. So at future OSB team meetings, we'll be able to talk about more detailed uh, descriptions of what the planning framework will look like, especially in terms of like medium or smaller scale lifts. And then also start to talk about the scoping for what would be the first big lift. And that would be later in the year. And this will probably roll through to early 2022 in terms of finalizing what this ultimate approach will look like for the next 10 years. And with that, Darren, could you move to the next slide, please? Thanks. You'll see this is like a mirror image of the slide Dan showed earlier. And Dan was providing that context in terms of the work planning, in terms of operations for programs and projects. And we know that in building out a complete work plan, we also need to think about what the planning framework for the department might look like. And how do we get the right balance of planning efforts compared to things that we're implementing be based upon current policy or ongoing programs? Uh, to that extent of the strategy update planning framework, which is called FS10, if you want to check it in the master plan, it, the important thing about the strategy, it really gets to the core of saying refine OSCP planning methods and products in order to better inform land management and prioritize the efficient use of funding over the next 10 years. So, as we've sort of pointed out, many of the current MP strategies, master plan strategies, have implementation actions that are already covered by the ongoing operations or existing plans, policy guidance, that basically continues to, allows us to continue doing the six year annual work planning. But it's also true that some of the strategies in the master plan do need updating or new policy guidance. For example, there's planning efforts that require more guidance in terms of policy around areas where it's pretty a new arena for us to start thinking about that guidance. And that could be efforts such as uh, equity planning or climate crisis initiatives. And we also have potential for some new plans coming down the pipe, uh, thinking about things such as water, scenic and cultural resource plans. In addition to that, 
We also have some excellent, and I know, uh, you know board members are aware of these obviously existing plans that have been around for a while. And the policy in them may be that some of it doesn't need updating. There may be only aspects of the policy that need updating, such as say the forest ecosystem management plan, which is known as FEMP or the grassland plan. And therefore, as we start to think about a comprehensive planning approach to support the strategies that needed updated or new planning guidance, the goal of this planning framework is to provide a prioritized, budgeted and manageable, and Dan touched on this, you know, based upon the resources we have in the department, to how we think about planning over the next 10 years. Next slide, please, Darren. So it's interesting to think about, and this is something we've done as staff over the last few months, is to consider how would we think about implementing this strategy, updating the planning framework. In its most basic terms, the strategy directs staff to reevaluate and update our planning approach and create a planning framework. And that's kind of the obvious part of this step. The new framework itself would continue to fully integrate all charter purposes and for how we think about open space uh, decision making. The planning framework will also continue to provide management guidance for like things like natural, agricultural, recreation, cultural, scenic resources as well as programming for areas such as education or ranger enforcement. When we think about how we update and implement this framework, we've got to think about refinements to the existing plans in terms of guidance from both a broad area and specific site plans. And that starts us to think about the scale of the planning, whether it's system-wide, it's area, or it's at a specific geographic location. We touched a little bit on that earlier with the parking and the trailheads and how we balance that frankly, across the scales and across the charter purposes. And then there's also things to think about in terms of, as I touched on earlier, if we have in place major policy areas from our existing system-wide plans, which ones need to be updated in terms of uh, aspects of them and where do we need sort of a wholesale update of the planning efforts. And this leads us to talk about the scale and complexity. And that brings us to where we are tonight. It's our first step in considering the larger scale efforts we've identified. And I think for the, the third time tonight, I'll mention the term big lifts. <laughs> and that's what Dan touched upon. And this is what we're gonna focus on tonight. And Dana, Darren will lead us through that thinking. Next slide, please, Darren. So my final slide and sort of the final summary I'll provide is as staff, a department, we started to develop and think about themes that would help us think about what is a major planning effort? What is a major big lift? And as we think about those themes, that's helped us define what is a big lift and then how we might prioritize those. And that's what Darren will get into the details of. And you can see here the bullets, there's nothing probably surprising in them. Uh, they're definitely just guidance. And then for example, bullet one talks about how multiple Charter purposes and multiple NP strategies typically would make us think about something as a big lift from the planning perspective. Bullet three gets at how we think about uh, you know, citywide standards for best practice engagement. When is it major engagement? A simple example is the uh, master plan that where we built out five engagement windows with the community, with the board, with council to ensure that we got the right level of community input. Uh, Bullet five, talking about the OSBT and the city council. Well, tonight is an example where we're providing an update or an inform or an action, but typically a big lift goes beyond that, doesn't it? It gets to things like work study sessions, uh, even a process committee to support the effort and make sure it keeps it on track. So that's kind of my summary and overview for tonight. Just before I pass you over to Darren, uh, I think it is worth mentioning, and frankly, with thanks to the people who have put input into what you're seeing tonight, is that this effort, uh, to date covers representation from the four service areas in the departments and their, all their associated work groups, as well as input from our management team and the director's team. So it's frankly worth thanking the staff for the effort and input that's gone in so far. And I just wanted to give the board a sense of that this has been across the department effort. And with that, I'll pass you over to Darren. Thank you, Mark. So as we are diving a bit more into what this looks like in terms of the next 10 years and what we could anticipate those big lifts needing to be, one of the things that I think Dan has described in the past as being sort of the first flag in the ground is the fact that the citywide planning expectations are that we 
update our master plan every five years. That's a practice that other departments have been in for a number of, uh, quite honestly, decades. Um, there is a practice that involves, however, every it, it, at the midterm, making that a minor update where you, for example, have just recently seen the minor update come through for, for the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan where the scale of engagement, the scale of questions that are being asked is very different from those that are asked at the major planning update or the, the renewal of the master plan. And so we would take the similar approach here so that we, now, now that we are in compliance with um, citywide guidance, now that we have our, a master plan, um, that we stay in compliance and, and revisit that every um, five years. Knowing that that is uh, an effort that still, even at a midterm update at a minor level, would take um, some effort on the part of staff, community board, and council. Knowing that big lifts involve a multi-year effort uh, for each one, that leaves essentially the, the room in the puzzle making of work planning for two other big lifts within the next decade. And the first being prior to and the second being after that midterm update in the master plan process. And really what both Dan and Mark have alluded to is that these are areas that we know still yet have a number of unanswered questions and complex decision making and conversations to be had. And, and so in or and yet they are in pursuit of that master plan vision that we defined for ourselves working with community board and council in terms of what we wanted to achieve by 2030. So these are these are efforts that would advance that that ball down the ball down the field, so to speak. But to under to really understand what they they are, even though we set the the um, the process in motion in the master plan itself we needed to understand from staff a bit more. We needed to dig deeper in order to make those first steps on updating the planning framework and, and trying to address the needs that emerge in that process. And so we asked staff, again, as Mark said, through uh, across all four service areas, essentially these major questions. So of those existing plans, whether it be FEMP or the grassland plan or a visitor master plan, et cetera, what guidance is missing or needs updating? What is, is anything missing or, or are, there, are there issues that hinder your work? Or are there updates to those plans that may further advance your work that you've been waiting for or needing? And then as we think separately about, as Mark initi uh, indicated, those areas where we don't currently have a broad enough or, or strategic enough policy, um, when we think about updating, or excuse me, achieving the master plan vision, what, what needs addressing from a planning perspective? And as it relates to both of these questions, it was then also a question to staff around how important are these needs? How, how much do they align with tier one strategies, for example, that are already identified in the master plan? And in that process of, of meeting with so many staff, there were a whole lot of um, potential plans that were identified. And that ranged from either replacing or updating the 2005 visitor master plan or addressing from a planning, integrated planning standpoint, the Eastern quadrant of the system where we ha currently have, for example, TSAs for other parts of the system, we have not yet taken a, an approach like that in the East. As M Mark mentioned, opportunities to update components of the grassland plan or the FEMP, a forest ecology management plan, new efforts that aren't yet in place like addressing cultural resources, water, equity, climate, permits and fees, connecting youth to nature, all these components were embedded in the master plan itself. And there are there is guidance within the master plan around operationalizing those strategies. And yet there were still there was still recognition that for some of those there are these integrated decision making processes that needed to happen to further advance that work. In going through then that sort of second part of the engagement with staff and trying to understand how important these planning needs are, there was a lot of consensus, as Mark is indicating, around there being three that really rise to the top. Arguably, that second bullet is talking about that midterm update to the master plan, and we know we have to do that. But there were also conversations around that being a real opportunity as we re-envision the planning framework to make that a str of strategic value to both staff and the community. The, the other two that rose to the top are um, the, the first being some sort of recreation plan. And, and again, that would replace the 2005 uh, visitor master plan 
There is no name for what that would be. That's something that we need to work through. But the concept there is um, really responding to RRSE1 in the master plan, address increasing visitation. And we are, um, a staff felt very comfortable moving forward with this approach uh, because it, again, it, it does respond to the, to the priorities we really heard from uh, community boarding council in the master plan itself. And then also uh, addressing the integrated planning needs in the east area. So we know though that leaves these sort of other, these other planning needs out there. And knowing that we are operating in the context that Dan described where we have a very robust work plan as is and therefore limited capacity in engaging those same staff in big planning efforts that we really need to find efficiencies and, and quite honestly, not just for staff sake, but also the community sake. There was an analysis prior to the master plan of how often we had been asking the community to engage in our planning processes and it was more or less nonstop for about 20 or 25 years. So um, trying to be cognizant of that as well. And so we would be looking at as we continue to work on updating our planning framework, which is again, Mark said, we'll be bringing more back to the board on this. But as we continue those conversations, we're going to be looking to see how we can address those other needs, those sort of medium lifts, as we might call them, through whether that be a future update to the master plan at either the midterm or full renewal uh, stage, or working those into the multi-year work planning approach that Dan described. So as we figure out the big pieces, the big lifts, that allows us then to figure out whether smaller pieces can fit and how they relate and support each other. And so in laying out a work plan as it relates to major planning and design efforts over the next decade, again, we know that that midterm update needs to happen about mid-decade. That is an opportunity to consider the ways that we might engage, uh, include policy updates to those existing plans. As Mark said, we, we definitely heard from staff that there are there is not consensus around needing to overhaul, for example, the grassland plan, whereas most of it is actually very operational and very functional. There are just strategic components that may need addressing, similarly with the forest plan. Um, and so we would look at ways of addressing those planning needs that, that were also called for in the master plan by uh, rolling those into this midterm update. So that means then in the first part of the decade, responding to the tier one strategy of addressing increasing visitation that we would start work on the recreation management plan. Again, that being a working title, that's something that we need to work on. Um, and what that would do is it would allow, as Dan laid out, us to continue working on implementation of our existing plans, whether that be finishing up imp implementation in the West TSA, components of the North TSA, focusing on a, a number of those uh, implementation projects and programs, um, while also starting the planning process that will kind of keep us ahead of the game um, as it relates to system-wide guidance regarding uh, visitor use management or recreation. Um, what that would involve as we start thinking about uh, scoping that is that we would honestly spend, as we did in the master plan process, the next 18 months or so, starting to scope that process, making sure that we establish a clear enough uh, uh, stepwise process that the staff and community can respond to and understand, as well as pulling together a set of data and analysis that would support the engagement um, that would then follow. That's in alignment with citywide guidance uh, regarding engagement, which is to say that we want to start out our planning processes with that foundation of information. And so we would produce some kind of inventory report as it rela relates to uh, recreation and the engagement with uh, and, and the ways that that interfaces with other charter purposes as, as the board was discussing earlier in relation to, to Anna's work. And that also does give us the opportunity to pull in Anna's work as well as other human dimensions data and, and other data needs um, and do them justice in terms of putting together and, and framing the conversation we know that needs to be had in an appropriate way. Um, we would then anticipate starting engagement with the public in 20, or early 2023, because it will take us through next year to put together all that analysis and scoping. Um, we then anticipate moving into the East Area Plan towards the latter half of the decade. And what that also does is it still respects those implementation projects and programs that have been called for in our other uh, planning processes that we've mentioned a couple of times tonight. 
so that we can then uh, sort of catch up um, and and yet again stay ahead of the game in terms of what's needed then in the East Area Plan and anticipate implementation for that happening um, and starting to happen in the following decade. So then again, when we think about how we're going to address those other planning needs, whether we call them medium lifts or something else, we will, as we continue working through updating our planning framework, we need to refine what, what those really are and what those approaches need to be, what those what we might call our planning services or planning products that we provide. And then try and imagine the way then those smaller pieces can fit into the puzzle of the next 10 years um, work planning wise. There are, for example, opportunities as it relates to site plans where we may time those site planning efforts to coincide with these larger big, big lifts so that we can be having conversations, not just at the site specific scale, but also at the larger area scale um, where that's appropriate. So as it relates to this visitor use management planning component that we would move into um, in the next few years. This is a diagram that is pulled from the master plan. So this is a framework that was uh, adapted from the Interagency Visitor Use Management Council, which is a, a consortium of multiple federal land management agencies that have agreed on a standard approach to uh, visitor use management planning. And that is to say that we, before beginning the actual planning process, we have committed to coming to the board with the scope for that planning process, much like we did for the master plan. And so that would absolutely be our first step that we um, would begin this next process with as well. We know, however, that we are in, a, this is a cycle. This is an adaptive management cycle. It's, uh, it should be you know, very familiar to all of us in the sense that there are things currently going on in relation to um, implementing our existing visitor use management guidance and working with our partners. So for example, as we think about implementing our existing guidance, um, we are in constant coordination and will consider and will continue doing so um, with our partners at Boulder County, Jefferson County, up and down the Front Range, as well as uh, CPW um, and others to, to really try and coordinate in a, in a collaborative way the ways that we can address um, increasing use and or changes in visitation patterns that affect either experience or resource condition. And, and, and you know, it, it's worth just reminding ourselves that also we're in the monitoring phase and, and what Anna presented earlier tonight, as well as other data that you've seen in uh, previous months is really also in support of what will become our, our next sort of round of updating that visitor use management guidance. Just again, a little bit more detail uh, to, to, as it relates to our first big lift, if we think about the recreation topics that are identified in the master plan, this is a summation of, of those topics uh, pulled from multiple strategies uh, and focus areas. And so it, we anticipate that the scope could include a number, if not all of these topics, which means that yes, we would be increasing, uh, addressing increasing visitation, but also the ways, as we were talking about earlier, that undesignated trails plays into that conversation. The ways that multimodal access, dog management, range of experiences, all these things connecting youth to nature um, play into this conversation of, of visitor, use, uh, visitor use and experience. And you can see here, it's, it's more demonstration of the complexity of the conversation and why uh, you know, I think Dan was inspired to set that context in terms of what the organizational capacity um, what it takes to, to really develop these conversations, the number of work groups that we would need to engage in order to uh, work through this process, and the number of um, community interest groups or community stakeholders that would be uh, interested in participating in the process. So we are trying to take a stepwise approach to this, as you've seen in previous uh, months that, you know, our work plan and our budget for 2021 is largely in place and what we do have uh, uh, work planned out is that we would continue updating this planning framework as we've been talking about tonight and that we would return later this year with an updated uh, approach to that. That we would start scoping the process for the, the recreation plan or, or, or what, that, what that will eventually be called and that similarly we would return to the board with that draft scope before embarking on that planning process. We'd move, as I mentioned earlier in 22, into the development of that recreation inventory report. 
and start public engagement for that first big lift uh, in early 2023. So, bulk of my presentation is largely over and we thought that it might be helpful to think about these two questions in particular as you kind of think about what questions or feedback you may have. We'd like to know if you have any feedback on that sequence we've laid out that we uh, are moving forward with and whether you feel that approach is really moving, moving the dial, moving us towards that master plan vision for 2030 that we defined for ourselves. Uh, and Darren, can you, uh send copies of this presentation to the board too. I think it would help us to organize our thinking uh, as, we, as we move ahead. Uh, do you want to entertain questions at this point? Absolutely, happy to. Okay, well, while I'm waiting for the uh, image of all the members to come up, let me just ask a question that, you know, maybe a little bit aside, but um, maybe you could talk for just a minute uh, from 30,000 feet about how our new properties fit into, because you've got more than enough to do, obviously. And so maybe you could just say a little bit about how you see those things coming into the overall planning process. Dan, I, I imagine you may want to speak. Well, I, I, I can begin and just say there's exceptions to every rule. <laughs> because <laughs> typically for something, let's say with a uh, gum barrel hill complex, or perhaps uh, the upcoming Fort Chambers poor farm planning process, one approach could have been to fold that in into something like the East Area Plan and do it in conjunction with a larger context in mind. Uh, both of those things, when we analyzed them, had very specific and compelling reasons why we wanted to pull those out and do them on a site-specific level. So mm -hmm. I think that points to Darren's um, framework in that even um, within a framework was we may want to have those options of doing something more site specific in terms of areas in an area context where others um, because of its um, uh, a whole bunch of connectivity issues or other things or other reasons we may want to do some of those new planning initiatives in context with a larger area plan. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that the planning framework gives us the option to sort of uh, select those things but in terms of what you're going to see, what you saw last year, and what you'll you'll get a report on, I believe, in the coming months or so, about the poor farm Fort Chambers property, is that those ones we selected to do out of context from the an area plan and put it in into its site specific plan. So I believe North TSA, Kurt, I think took ten recently approved proper properties and and did the planning sort of within the context of that area plan, and I'm yeah. at get to the east, there'll be a number of new properties that will be folded into that, but there will be exceptions. And uh, of course, I just named a couple of them right off the bat. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions, raise your hand and I will, who's up first? Can't believe there's no questions. Uh, Dave and you're muted. Yeah, I didn't want to contribute to the disbelief that we wouldn't have any questions. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Darren, uh, thanks for that. And Dan uh, and, and Mark, uh, I think that was very helpful in kind of giving us the, the overall context of uh, what we're looking at in the next 10 years. I don't have a question per se, but I do have a comment. And, and that is that uh, I would urge that in the development of the strategies for you know the the planning effort in the next few years, and I'm I'm thinking probably within the next three to five years, that uh, the department consider the institutional memory that still exists in the staff. And um, I guess the, the primary examples for me are that there are several staff that were instrumental, in fact, were responsible for some of the first plans, or early plans that are still there, but they probably won't be there for long. And it strikes me that it would be an excellent strategy for the department to make sure that their 
institutional memory as far as uh, building that planning foundation um, for future management actions is taken advantage of. And I'm, I'm thinking particularly in the resource uh, plans, but also, you know, the TS, the trail study area planning as well. And, and so specifically, the, I, I think the, uh, the policy update notion for the grassland plan and the forest ecosystem plan is a good one. I, I think uh, it just reflects the, the uh, excellent planning effort that went into it initially such that there doesn't have to not necessarily be major revisions but you know kind of modest tweaks perhaps and and some of the the resource uh, issues I think particularly the forest uh, issue as far as the forest ecology and uh, wildfire uh, hazard and potential um, you know, kind of gives us uh, the, the uh, emphasis that we ought to pay attention to uh, some of those things um, that maybe don't rise to the, you know, the big lift, but are particularly important, uh, both for management wise, as well as for the community. So this is just urging that uh, don't overlook, you know, the institutional memory because it won't be there forever. And it will certainly, I think, benefit uh, going forward on, on several of these fronts. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Oh, Dave, can I just say, I was catching up with Mark Gershman today, you know, at a catch up that we do every other week. And he mentioned that you might, Darren might not want to say replace the visitor master plan because Dave had a heavy hand that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say update. So <laughs> there is the acknowledgement within staff as well. I board remember you didn't go back that far. You didn't warn me. I was also going to say thanks because it kind of builds Dave on what you and Kurt were saying is that we also as part of updating our planning framework have acknowledged that we don't currently have a formalized process for amending our plans. It's something that, for example, you know, Kurt, I see you nodding your head perhaps at the federal level, you, you've been through a similar process where it's a formal addendum uh, that is adapted mm -hmm. that replaces only certain sections of a particular plan. And we'd like to explore the ways that we could do that and, and be more overt about that uh, here at OSMP. Great. Uh, I think that's, I'll just say a quick thing and then get to you, Hal. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense to have the visitor plan be a high priority. I do worry a little bit how we're gonna do that without it becoming a master plan process, just because the community will be so interested in it. And how can you, carry forward this, the types of decisions and priorities that were created in the master plan so that that doesn't all get revisited. Because uh, I think there'll be a fair bit of pressure to try to do that. So I, I don't know the answer to this, Darren. I just uh, recognize the challenge. Kurt, and just a quick response would be, as Darren pointed to, you know, if you remember, we did the scoping for the master plan and that Darren pointed out that was a lengthy process, but what it did was it set the master plan up for success, didn't it? And, and the fact that we bring the scope to the board and the community, so there's kind of agreement at the beginning about what process we're using. It's not like halfway into the process, someone, right. hey, why have we gone down this route? We'd be able to go back and say, here's what we agreed to look at in this effort. And yeah, it will require, one. it can't be finite. It's got to be focused on the topics or issues that need addressing. Yeah. And hopefully carry forward what sideboards we can from the master plan so that we don't revisit those. Uh, again, exactly. I think this will be challenging. Um, Hal, I think you were next. Yeah, um, both Darren and Mark, I, you actually both just hit on what I was gonna comment on. And that is, um, I love this idea of targeted openings of plans. If we really are doing great policy and governance, it should be more of a process of refinement than total reinvention. And I guess my one suggestion would be as far as staff communication to the board to not be hesitant to put forward to say, hey, we'd like to do a targeted look at this plan. And that would allow us to gain a serious amount of scope to work on these other things that you may think are important and be very overt about the motivation for why to do a targeted <laughs> update and then hold a brief pre-meeting to say, are we all comfortable with targeting it in this way? to prevent that creep that we know where things just get very to be generalized. Hmm. Um, and anyway, I, I just I just react when you guys are very explicit about your desires and, and 
why they're beneficial. It really helps us run with you on those, you know? Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Other thoughts for, yeah, Caroline, and you're muted. So I'm gonna try and be as, as clear as I can with this and um, what I'm about to say may or may not be very popular. Um, but I, I'm hoping that as we move forward, as we have all had to do in life, that we stop and take a really big pause as COVID-19 um, mm -hmm. has made us do. So listening to everyone talk, um, I hear us saying that we don't have really a formal process for amending the plan. Um, we can focus on topics or issues that need addressing. And then um, as Hal just said, you know, refinement versus re-envision. So I think that incorporation of what we need um, for understanding for climate change and how that is going to affect the health of our population is just something that as we move forward talking about a 10-year plan, I think really should be um, the top subject and then let that trickle down into, into what it may be, whether we do that as kind of a, an a broad umbrella or we incorporate it, um, which I think would probably be more beneficial into each of our four service areas. Um, <clears throat> I, and I saw that there was, you know, the, um, you guys had climate crisis initiatives in some of the planning. <clears throat> uh, I just think that we really need to think about what we're doing when we're, we're starting these kind of long-term plans and how the data that, that we have from science and how that relates to policy um, examples that we all know, changing precipitation patterns, um, rising air, water temperatures, waterborne illnesses, water insecurity, um, carbon sequestration, healthy soils, zoonotic disease. I just think that kind of like a revision of who we are and what we're doing here with open space. Um, I think that it, it used to be that we could really separate kind of land and people and we're all really learning that we cannot do that anymore and our children and our grandchildren are really going to be affected by those decisions that we make today and especially those of us that are fortunate enough to be able um, to make 10 year plans. Um, I just think maybe if we all view it as, you know, each and every staff member within open space and us on the board, you know, we really are public health practitioners in so many ways with land, soil, and water. So as opposed to all of us viewing our jobs as, as the title that we're given um, right now within open space, just that we all really have a responsibility to make these new plans and adjustments and however we want to do it um, to really protect the public and protect the people and uh, protect everything you know moving forward between COVID and the fires that we had and, and knowing drought and issues with water. It's just, um, I think that, that the climate change initiative should not be part of the bullet points. I think it should just be at the top of every bullet point um, and just have, have our facts from the data that's put out there for us. Um, and, and like I said, incorporate that into every policy and change that we're thinking about making. So you will hear me say that a lot moving forward as we continue to talk about this topic. Um, so just, you know, everyone like a little food for thought um, on that tonight and just, uh, you know, moving forward, we'll continue to discuss it. So thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Other thoughts? Karen. Yeah, I am, I have to say I'm heartened by the idea of targeted efforts and addenda and refining things that we have. I, my first reaction to this item in the packet was Oh my God, we're starting more 10 years planning to plan to plan processes. 
And as Darren said in her remarks at the very beginning, we've been planning for decades <laughs> and engaging hundreds and thousands of community members in planning again and again and again. And, and I think there's a real desire um, as expressed by Mark McIntyre in a newspaper article in the last week or so, to be mm -hmm. able to say from the perspective of TAB, this was not OSMP. <clears throat> um, you know, we said we'd do this this year and we did it. And here are the results. And I think there's a real hungering on the part of, of residents of this town to be able to do more of that rather than to do more planning um, and to actually see the results of our efforts. And, and so I, my cringing when I started reading this part of the agenda was, oh my God, we just finished the master plan and now we're gonna spend another two to 10 years planning for other plans. And I really hope we can get away from, save me from that perspective. <laughs> Yeah, Karen. Oh, sorry, Mark. Did you want to respond? No, please go ahead first. Uh, it's it's a sentiment shared by many, and I, we appreciate the candor. And you know, we really do. I think that we are also, as we talk about updating the planning framework, trying to re envision <laughs> how we do how we do planning, how we do design, in such that is in such a way more operationalized um, and and can produce value in different ways, other than. You know, we, we certainly will continue to have this role in trying to facilitate these broader policy conversations as we um, know are critical, but work at, at all scales of land management are critical. And that's why it really, I think, Dan, you just, your introduction was perfect in terms of really wanting to prioritize the, the things that we are doing on the ground and, and, and fitting in the planning needs uh, around those. Yeah, I, Karen, I, I, I share your sentiment. Um, I hear it, uh, I've heard it, you know, pretty loud and clear at the staff level that um, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of already approved actions, you know, uh, still waiting to be implemented, that sort of thing. Um, how do we prioritize that? Um, and really it's, it's an unofficial term, but I was gonna, like 2020, 2021, 2021, 2022, 2023, can we just call it the era of implementation and, <laughs> yeah, and implementation get away from planning yeah. as, as we can. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's, I'm really heartened to hear that there seems to be consensus building among the trustees that a very targeted approach. If we feel policy changes as needed is really the preferable approach. We weren't sure how this was going to land with you in that regard. So it's really heartening to me, and I think it's going to be to the staff to know that we have that flexibility uh, uh, to go that route. Um, and basically, um, as this was evolving, it was like even one big planning lift on either side of the master plan time horizon is a big ask. And and um, and so I, I fully share your sentiment, and and um, as we go and we continue to refine this, I think we can take tonight's conversation away and, 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 and continue to refine and bring something back that reflects, mm -hmm. I think, what we're hearing tonight, too. And, uh, and like, like Dan, uh, like Dave suggested, um, I think if you went to Chris um, and to Lynn and Megan and said, in the FEMP or in the Grasslands yeah. Management Plan, what are the what are the one or two or three things that we need to take a look at and and do targeted revisions of? I mean, I think in two seconds, yep. those folks could identify those things. And if those kinds of targeted needs were brought back to the board, um, I just think we'd feel much better about where we were going rather than framing this as another major planning effort. Now that we've recovered from the master plan, let's do another major planning effort. Yeah, 
Well, one way to look at it, Karen, and that's exact, those are the exact conversations that we had over the last eight months. It's exactly what you said. We went to the subject matter experts and ha had them give us their honest assessment of the plan. Are you being hampered right now? Can you move forward with what you need to move forward with under existing guidance? And what we heard for the most part of those 15 ideas out there that except for two, uh, there was a, a pretty much consensus that we've got what we need except for some minor alterations. And so one of the, one way to look about this is there's 15 potential planning needs out there. We're coming forward with maybe sequencing of two of them. Um, we were a little hesitant to think, boy, what if they, what if they uh, are wondering when the big lift is for grasslands and, and water and all these other ones. So we're really happy that we're hearing what we're hearing because overall that was the staff sentiment, um, except for two exceptions in which we feel like there's a bigger lift there. Um, but, um, but we're happy to continue that, even that conversation based on what we're hearing tonight. Dan, if I, if I could just add to, um, add to that a little bit. Um, it was interesting because there was, like, to get to what Dan said, there was actually, you know, our, our department internally is quite happy to debate in a very robust way, you know, what we should be doing. We've got a very sort of transparent discussion in the department, <coughs> really healthy. And there was actually consensus when we brought this back to the teams after discussing it, that this came through without disagreement. There wasn't uh, uh, disagreement over what we should be prioritizing. Hmm. To get to the point that some of the terms that came up were, can we make sure when we do this, it's not a bubble diagram, it's fiscally constrained. It's hmm. beyond just targeted, it gets to like solution based. Can we have like a scalpel instead of a sledgehammer to look at this? The reason we can do that now, frankly, is we've got new ways, as we just saw in an earlier presentation, of collecting data that changes us from looking at sort of effect to actually getting into cause. And that's really what we're hoping to do here. And we know, for instance, we've got higher visitation has increased exponentially over the last 10, 20 years. And we know that all systems across the front range are really having to grapple with this. So we want to sit back and get into it using that sort of fiscally constrained approach, to <laughs> targeted, and so it comes, when it comes back to the board, you'll see that it is focusing in on what we need to do on the ground, where we don't have existing policy, or we've got issues that require that sort of, you know, a lot of effort, roll up our sleeves to get into it, come up with the actions that will solve it. So it is, we're excited on our end from that perspective. I think that's a fantastic point, Mark. I would point to the agricultural application document as a major success of where in a short amount of time, we fixed a plan that was very well laid and that it ran into some reality that was unexpected, right? And then we saw a red line document and the red line document gave all the board members the confidence to know I'm looking at each and every change. I think procedurally, sometimes where we fail is if we redesign a document, reformat it, it gives a board member the feeling that they need to read each and every word with the utmost care, which naturally extends a process. So to whatever extent we can learn, I think from those episodes where we do execute quickly and we all very much agree and arrive at consensus and sort of what created the psychological stability in the process to let that proceed is all great stuff to apply to these coming projects. Okay, any other closing thoughts before we thank Mark and Darren? All right, we look forward to the next chapter. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks for the feedback, Thank everyone. Thanks, Darren. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Back to you, Dan. All right, just a, a couple of minor um, heads up uh, updates. Um, so um, our conversations um, are in regarding uh, uh, tribal relations and, and tribal uh, aspects um, um, have some uh, specific dates. On the 18th of this month, we have a conference call with representative tribes. As you know, last year's consultation uh, was canceled. And uh, there's been a uh, of, of talk about how we uh, make some decisions about a future consultation. So we are going to be on a virtual call 
with tribal reps on the 18th to talk about uh, a desire to possibly do a, a virtual consultation. It might have to be scaled down a little bit versus the face-to-face -face uh, uh, or if they would prefer for us just to um, uh, uh, delay until uh, a face-to-face -face, uh, needs to be put in place. We're pretty close to uh, coming up with um, uh, conclusions on a couple of the things that we're consulting about. So there is some desire to bring it across the finish line, um, but uh, we would like to get their feel for how they would feel about doing that virtually. And uh, we'll get some feedback from them on the 18th. And uh, I can report back in March about uh, what the sentiment was and wh where we might go in terms of next steps. Uh, there's also an emerging issue and it's more of a citywide issue, but I thought I'd just update you in, in terms of um, uh, tribal relations. And that is uh, the desire to uh, 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 develop a land acknowledgement. And so our staff, because of our history and expertise of working with tribal uh, governments um, and, and working uh, and developing MOUs with the tribes and working on tribal relations issues, we are lending support to that citywide effort to develop a land acknowledgement. And uh, there'll be uh, um, a couple of steps along the way, culminating probably with a update to council uh, in September sort of time frame, and uh, um, the um, uh, Human Rights Commission uh, will also uh, um, uh, be involved and I actually be reporting to them. They want me to come and report at their next board meeting about what tribal consultation is and, and what the next step is with that. And we'll also update them on the land acknowledgement effort that's uh, starting to gain some traction. Uh, secondly, I just wanted to let you know about uh, wildfire is obviously on the top of people's minds uh, over the past year and on the 18th as well at noon, there's a wildfire uh, fire summit uh, that is planned. Uh, Joe Nagus, uh, Congressman, um, is uh, going to be part of that. I believe even our, our senators and the governor may actually be on that call as well. I'm not too sure of, of who will be participating. But if anybody is interested, there is a sign up at uh, Congressman Joe Nagus's uh, 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 website, Nagus, N-E-G-U-S-E, 2021.com. I believe he's got a link to a sign up for uh, that particular event. So I just wanted to let you make you aware of that. So with that, that's my uh, couple of brief announcements and we'll be turn it back to you, Kurt. Okay, uh, we're to matters from the board. I'm going to propose a five minute break. So everyone to be back at about 17, 18 minutes past the hour. We are in recess. Amazing, but nice. And were any of our people speaking at the February 18th summit? Do you know? Uh, uh, the wildfire? wildfire? Mm -hmm. John, I don't believe so. Um, no, we're not, we're not scheduled on any of the panels, Caroline. Oh, they're, they're doing it like a, a panel thing, huh? That'll be exciting. Oh. Okay, I see most of us back here, I think. Um, we're going to matters from the board. I know we have the topic of uh, South Boulder Creek uh, flood mitigation and CU South uh, timelines. Um, do others have topics? I just want to note them down here so I know roughly how many we've got. Karen, do you have an additional? Yes. I just have a quick question that I, I think goes back to the matters from the department. Um, based on things in a packet. I think it's a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, on the, the uh, information about Chautauqua, Dan, uh, Flags, I'm sorry, Flagstaff Summit facilities. Mm -hmm. um, I really liked the idea of leaving um, 
some of the facilities for smaller groups, non-reservation -re mm -hmm. facilities, so that they could be accessed by smaller groups more easily. But it wasn't clear to me that there would be any parking available for them. Well, um, there's not specific parking that's assigned to a specific specific facility. Right. So some so of the changes. Spaces yeah. available. So some of the changes we were making was uh, an, an attempt to sort of address that in a little bit of an indirect way, as opposed to, you know, assigning assigning parking to a specific facility. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I guess the, uh, the parking spots per se is, is a little bit of a separate issue, but I, I don't know, do you have a, what, what is your specific question in general there? Well, would, would there be room for those people to park if the facility is available and there's no place for them to put a vehicle, then it's kind of an empty, it's kind of a non-access facility. Yeah, um, Leah, or, or, oh, hi, Leah. <laughs> um, I know you worked with a team in, in, in sort of putting these uh, recommended changes together, and I'm sure that the parking alignment with facility reservations, that correlation was sort of, uh, came into the thinking in terms of some of the changes we we're making, but do you have any, any comment or responses to Karen? Sure, yeah, and, and Megan is on too. She'll probably do be more eloquent than me, but Karen, did you have a specific? Yeah, it's specifically about the, the um, facilities on Flagstaff that are no longer by reservation to make them more accessible to, to families that want to just use a, a um, one of the smaller facilities. But, but my question is, would they have any access to parking or is it just a, a facility that's available with no parking available? I, I might still be a little confused that the memo that we, what we were talking about was lowering the group capacity size for the facilities that we do rent out. I don't know if we were proposing removing availability. Um, well, and, and the top of the second page, it says reducing the maximum reservation capacity and thereby reducing parking congestion on Flagstaff Summit Road would create more opportunities for smaller groups, fewer than 25, to access the non reserved shelters on a first come, first serve basis. And, and given the limits on parking up there, it wasn't clear to me that those non-reserved smaller shelters would have an ability I, to park anywhere. I, I think your question might be, is there is there guaranteed parking that would be available for those facilities? And I guess, right. if, yeah. And th there's not guaranteed parking, which was one of the reasons for lowering the number also. Um, but basically like if we are lowering from 150 to 100, one that helps with congestion and enforcement issues and some of the other things that were noted in there, but would also allow like if a family wanted to have a gathering at one of the picnic tables, they would have a better chance of having access to that. Um, parking still wouldn't be guaranteed for those. It was just another consideration for lowering the amount of people that might book one site at a time. Okay. Uh, Kirk, could I jump in? Right <laughs> yeah, Dave, do you want to call a quick on that? Yeah, real quickly. So, uh, Lee and Dan, I, I had a question in um, on the next paragraph and the percentages that, uh, that are there. It, um, you've got 73% um, of the 218 uh, reservations were of 100 or less, and then you have 47% of reservations were made for 50 or fewer people. So is the 47 uh, part of the 73? So there's 73% of 100 or less, and so 47% of that 73% was 50 or less. Is that the right interpretation? You know, Dave, I think so. Yeah. Alex 
I just made Megan a co-host and I want, if, if you're okay with that, Megan, I wanna make sure that I'm presenting that correctly. I believe you have it right. But Megan, if you're on, do you mind? Yeah, um, it's just like me. Yeah, no worries, but there is some overlap there. So that was um, the way I drew those numbers were to show that reducing to a hundred wouldn't, would, wouldn't really be like a huge, um, affect a huge number of the reservations that we've seen in the past. And then also that 50 or fewer um, kind of sh to show that, you know, the majority, almost half of all reservations were already for 50 or fewer. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes. <laughs> There's overlap in those two statistics. Yeah. So the 47% subset is part of the 70. Right. That's what I wanted to know. Yes. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Karen, did that address your questions? Yeah. Parking is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. <laughs> okay. Um, are there members that want to raise other issues under matters besides um, South Boulder Creek and CU South? I'm not seeing any hands being raised. And if you have something you want to bring up later, that's fine. So it just looks like our principal topic here is South Boulder Creek flood mitigation and CU South. And so with that, I will turn to Karen if you want to uh, kick off that. Yes. Does the whole board know what happened at council with you, Kurt? Uh, we have, uh, I, I for gave the record, an update we could provide after, an update. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, most of the presentation was by utilities, by uh, right. uh, Joe Tadeuchi uh, and Brandon, um, just describing the, some of the key findings of the uh, analysis of the upstream option. Uh, that we were briefed on. And then I gave uh, just a uh, very few remarks uh, highlighting what I thought the particular areas of interest were for uh, the board. Uh, and there wasn't a lot of additional discussion about where council is going next, except the possibility of uh, trying to reach some decisions in May or June. Uh, but Karen, did you remember more than that? Well, you gave an eloquent little uh, summary of what the board had done and what the <laughs> subcommittee had done on upstream option and the board's decision on that. Yes, it certainly was eloquent. Uh, <laughs> and the but, council is very appreciative of having the board wrap there, I might add. Oh, well, uh, thank you, Dan. Um, so uh, Karen, do you wanna lead out with, uh, you know, to introduce the topic? Uh, so um, given that, that the upstream option is now off the table and we're proceeding with variant one 100 year design um, and based on all the comments that I've heard about flood mitigation from the people who are involved in the uh, public participation events around annexation and comments from public and council about where, we, where we're headed next with CU South, I started worrying about the public and council needing to know what still needs to happen with flood mitigation, that just because the upstream option is off the table, that doesn't mean there's a, a clear or simple path to what happens next with flood mitigation. And I feel like because some decisions are coming right up in the next few months about annexation, that, that there needs to be a broader understanding of what um, still needs to happen to deal with the flood mitigation issues around South Boulder Creek and especially around the open space and mountain parks, state natural area lands. And so 
I spent some time in January um, going back in the records and looking at the uh, board packets and minutes from um, March and July 2013 when CDOT expanded uh, Highway 36 and um, at that point OSBT disposed of some land to facilitate that Highway 36 expansion. And I wanted to review for myself what happened um, at that time and you know what it involved and what went on. And so I spent quite a bit of time reading documents and reviewing them and all. And um, just to give you an overview of, of what I learned, I, I forwarded to Leah a Word doc that I'm hoping she can put up on a shared screen. Which is a list of, of uh, a dozen or so items, thanks. Um, that that are uh, that were included at that time in 2013, prior to the board's uh, decision to dispose of a very small amount of land for that 2013 expansion of Highway 36. And you can see as you read down the list that it includes everything from um, CDOT, which was the the agency to whom the disposal was made, having already budgeted and committed funds for the project and for the mitigation um, to uh, having all the permits in hand from all the agencies and approvals that were needed uh, to having done an EIS and having assessed the mitigation options and having done a programmatic biological opinion and a site-specific biological opinion. And you can see on down the list, it, it's a really detailed, complex set of, of things that need to be done. And, and I don't think there's understanding either among members of the public or the council that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on flood mitigation and, um, and, and quite frankly, a lot of unknowns that still need to be worked on because I keep hearing reference to, well, and we'll have the flood mitigation a long time before CU will ever wanna build on this site and statements like that. And so one of my concerns is where we go next and and how it's communicated to to make sure that the public and council have some idea of all the details that need attending to before we're ready to do any next step even though we've dispensed with the upstream option Karen, do you also want to tie in uh, CU South Annexation and your um, concerns or uncertainties there too? Well, there are, I don't want to get into annexation a lot tonight, but I, I have some personal concerns about that just because I live in South Boulder. But I guess I was, I was referring to open space concerns related to potential annexation decisions. Sure, there's there's, you know, what happens with the CU South property. And if, if we hope to have some of that acreage, then um, that's not going to be available for other parts of the annexation discussion, agreement, negotiation, whatever you want to call that. They're, they're interacting uh, elements to both the, the flood mitigation part and the annexation part. And I'm, I'm really concerned that, that uh, the public and the council doesn't lose sight of that. 
Okay, questions for Karen uh, or other comments here? And maybe we can go back to the uh, matrix view. Thank you very much. I see Dave's hand up. Dave, you wanna start? Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, you know, at the uh, process subcommittee meeting, the recent one, the latest one, I can't remember if it was last week or the week before, um, you know, there was uh, uh, some conversation about developing this uh, timeline or, or schedule, which I think, um, you know, was preliminarily presented at the council meeting. Um, and the concern I have is that it, it struck me that that timeline does not include the issues that Karen is talking about. And I, I guess it would strike me that we, the board, ought to at least weigh in on our notion of a timeline uh, as it relates to, um, you know, the issues that we've raised in uh, previous motions and, and board discussion and actions. So I, I guess I would welcome uh, any comments or discussion from staff in that regard and then uh, from the board members as well as far as, um, you know, kind of our inclination on uh, what we think our next steps need to be. Yeah. No, Dave, that's a great question. And uh, I updated Kurt and Hal when we got together for our agenda look ahead meetings of, um, about what March may look like uh, as far as what we uh, report back to you on and what we have a discussion on. And it looks like March is kind of the theme will be um, looking ahead, uh, looking ahead at the sequencing of the milestones, trying to put some dates on those what are those dates that uh, are OSMP related issues? And when are we uh, uh, roughly planning to schedule those in? And uh, so right now staff, uh, utility staff and headed by Joe and then Phil Kleisler, are, they've been working hard on putting a detailed milestone timeline together for 2021. Uh, when are those uh, community uh, touch base opportunities? One of the board and commission touch bases When's the next touch base with council? Um, uh, trying to put some subject matter to those touch bases. And that's gonna be daylighted for the first time to the process subcommittee a week from Friday. Uh, uh, we'll see if they have any sort of refinements to that, but what John and I are proposing that we do is that we bring that forward for the uh, March uh, discussion with the board. And um, I've also gotten, um, uh, thumbs up from both Joe and, and Phil that if they're needed at that meeting to facilitate a discussion on timeline and subject matter and 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 when OSBT uh, 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 is going to be keyed up for a discussion, um, we can all be there. Um, and so that will be the theme for four weeks from now, which is looking ahead for the rest of the year and trying to put together subject matters. I mean, I know we're all interested in groundwater. Uh, we're going to be uh, interested in, in when 30% design is coming down and what we're going to start to see with 30%. When is that scheduled for? And so all those things are going to start to get daylighted over the next couple of weeks. And, and uh, that, that's sort of what we're hoping we could dive into in March. Um, John, I don't know if you have anything to add to that as somebody who participates on the internal team kind of scoping this out, but no, I, I think um, I think you nailed it there, Dan. Um, I, I guess if if there were things beyond groundwater and uh, environmental mitigation that that the board would want to uh, consider uh, us looking into before the thirty percent design, that would be helpful to know tonight. Um, but generally, that was what we were thinking. The two big topics were to get into before there was a uh, design that was ready um, that would you know have any value at this point but if there are other things it would be great to know you're muted and i had such good things to say too yeah, um, do that <laughs> just for folks who may not be following it so closely 
our rough estimate of when the 30% design might be completed, the earliest point that I've heard maybe would be late fall of this year. Do you guys, is that roughly what you're thinking just in case somebody's not following this uh, timeline that closely? Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's our general understanding, Kurt. Uh, it might be that uh, the 30% wouldn't be completed until that following some um, you know, further input from say the board staff. Uh, so it might be completed out beyond uh, the fall, but that's when we expect to first right. be able to see something. So yeah. So it's not gonna show up on our doorstep in May or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. No. Other, so you had your hand up, I think. Um, yes, thank you, Kurt. Um, Karen, first off, I really appreciate um, that work that you did looking at that historical template. Um, I think it's very relevant and helpful. I personally came to this discussion this evening from a slightly different viewpoint, and that was referring back to this board's own mo motions over time, and particularly the one dated 71118. Um, I'd love to just read a, half of it right now. OSBT believes that the disposal issues are best addressed after the number of concepts has been narrowed and the preferred concepts have been more fully designed and specified. In the event that one or more concepts proceeds to preliminary design, OSBT intends to work with the city staff to identify the point in the process at which such concepts have sufficiently been designed and specified such that OSBT can then make a fully informed decision on any disposal question. I think the, the reason that this is important to me relative to the list that you provided is that I believe we owe the public a fulsome discussion of the charter and this disposal. If we choose to have that discussion at the end of the 14 checklist list that you presented earlier, which, necessit which necessitates many, many millions of dollars more of city investment and time, I think where we find ourselves is at the end of a fully checked list where we're having a discussion that's not actually even real. It's a theatrical thing where the, the, the decision has already been made by time, <clears throat> momentum, and inertia. So I tend to agree with John's point here that it would be helpful from my perspective this evening if we could come up with the few final points related to preliminary design that we think are the absolute crucial criteria and are required to discuss the project in the context of the charter and the, the disposal, because I don't believe all of those are necessary to have a fulsome discussion of that, thus putting some of our work transparently in front of the public before this project has completed itself. <clears throat> and how you uh, put your finger on the eternal dilemma, which is uh, when is too early and too late to have the discussions. Uh, so I, I would think that's part of what we focused uh, Dan and John on, which is to really help us understand what we know and what we don't yet know in March so that the board can address your question, which is, are there things we need to take action or to reinforce and when's the right time to do that? I mean, I think that's the question that's on my mind too. And, and it feels to be concise, John listed a couple of the key points and, and I'm just wondering from the point of view of trustees, <clears throat> With that, will we be able to have a fulsome discussion of um, the charter? Because there are a few observations I'd, I'd already love to make about that prior to heading into a final annexation, but before council enters this annexation discussion, I think some of that information is highly relevant and, and frankly must hear for city council. So that's my one of my concerns, uh, timing-wise. How, and that is, that is that uh, I think if the council is going to move ahead uh, on some decisions regarding annexation in April, May, or June, 
that it would behoove us as the open space board to have some more specific um, information on on the table. And the other concern I have is, frankly, Kurt, your you know um, much lamented departure from the board after uh, the March meeting, and so we will have a new probably um, you know somewhat neophyte board member on on this particular topic and it it just strikes me that timing wise we might want to look at the board getting together for a study session or you know a discussion prior to the march meeting so that the march meeting actually has uh, some uh, capacity for more definitive action uh, while Kurt is still here. And so I, I guess I'm a little concerned about the timing as far as uh, anything that the board does, because if we wait until March, that will be preliminary and then we're, we're into April and, and, and whatever. And I just think we're gonna start bumping up against uh, some other decision points by other entities. Dan, do you or John want to address the, the concern generally? Well, I, I think that once we all <clears throat> see the timeline, I think that we'll all have a sense of uh, decision time uh, timelines. Uh, the next uh, the next step that council will be getting an update on annexation will be <coughs> late April or early May, um, and 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 that will be a uh, an update. Um, um, I think that the, uh, the timeline, the most aggressive timeline, if everything gets put together as far as annexation will, is, is likely Q3 uh, would be aggressive. So, I mean, if, and I think that the, the next check-in with council is an update uh, for April and May. So if there's an annexation related um, uh, subject or concern that hasn't already been conveyed uh, through an existing motion. Um, yeah, March or April, April uh, would be a, a time to reiterate that or to uh, add something in. If it's regarding the flood mitigation project that really wouldn't be addressed through annexation, you know, that 30% design is out there in Q3, Q4. Uh, again, I think that there's time for us to have before, before that is to have a great conversation on uh, getting a report on what's the existing conditions for the groundwater, uh, what, is, what is more thoughts that OSMP Eco staff have on mitigation opportunities on the 119. But Dave, if, if, there's, yeah, if there's specific issues on the annexation that you think hasn't already been uh, raised by this board, um, and you want that in before council has their touch base, um, that, that's looking like a late April, early May type of thing, but we'll, we'll find out for sure uh, at the process subcommittee. Yeah, Dan, I just think that um, we, we, the, the annexation and the flood mitigation are, are wedded as far as the open space uh, issues are concerned. And so, um, I, I'm not really confident that if we wait to 30 percent, um, uh, you know, development plan before we come in, be, before we come in with some of the, uh, you know, the potential mitigation issues, um, because I think the the potential mitigation issues are associated with with CU South, and that you know the annex, in the annexation they have to be part of that annexation consideration. And so I, I, I guess I'm just uh, discomfited by the timing and what I consider to be the lack of clarity as far as uh, what, what the steps are related to the open space issues. For example, if there's an EIS required, which I'm assuming there will be, that's going to you know, be in a time frame that is is certainly much longer than what we're anticipating initially, and you know the outcome of that I think will certainly uh, 
uh, uh, relate to some of the uh, open space issues as well. So I'm just afraid that the annexation train is moving down a separate track or will soon be moving down a separate track from uh, the flood mitigation train. And it just strikes me that in our, in our collective minds as the board, we're not seeing that those actions are separate necessarily. And Carolyn, I've got your hand up. I want to let Dan or John respond first to Dave's question. Yeah, um, and Dan, you may you may want to as well. But uh, yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a good point, Dave. There there is a a fairly limited um, menu on the annexation from what the what the board might need and. And I th if you've had a chance to go through the briefing book, I, I would recommend that to all of the uh, board members to yeah. read through that carefully and see what's kind of on the table from the standpoint of environmental protection or mitigation and um, be, be up to speed on that. And if there are things in that that are missing, that, that would be super helpful to know um, however, the board has already expressed an interest for one thing in the 119 acres of OSO. They've expressed an interest in the water rights. And, um, and with, those, with that understanding already built into that briefing book and what council is going to have before it in May or June, that um, that that message is already there. Um, if if you felt that um, there were other things that are are not being picked up, that would be like critical to know uh, in in this shorter time frame that you're talking about. But I don't know what those things are. Okay, I'll go to Caroline. Um, just to let everyone know where I am and just to keep everything moving along. I agree with what Dave said with us coming together and having a study session while we still have Kurt's very valuable knowledge. Um, and I think that uh, that would be really good for expectations moving forward and, and what we are all trying to collectively do. Um, and I think that will help staff, council, CU, everyone be able to, to have um, more transparency and what we are all feeling together as a board. Um, may I ask just in, in, if, if the momentum is to have a, a study session and if there's some sort of element of staff preparation and who's in it, it would be super nice to know like what, this, what the theme rather than CU and South annexation and flood mitigation, like because there are specific conversations that we are building timelines out for such things as groundwater and 30% design and, and the OS and the 119. So it'd be super helpful to know like what what would be the theme of the study session so we could support you all um, in that. And uh, is it narrow or is it just a chance to talk more about all the issues or um, it, it would just be super helpful for John and I to get a sense for what you're thinking as the sort of the, if there is a focus uh, to the conversation. Caroline, go ahead, you're muted. Yeah, Dave, um, you can uh, correct me if you think a little bit differently about it or um, Karen Howe, please feel free to jump in. But I feel like uh, last year when we were discussing how to put together the disposal, I think Dave and I did some work um, that, that perhaps wasn't like the right vision for what we were doing in regards to the actual documentation and paperwork for the disposal. But I think that a lot of the issues that came up at that time um, when we were presented with that and Dave and I you know, went off and had our own um, subcommittee for a time there, I think that a lot of those uh, issues that we were trying to present to you then would probably still be relevant now for this study session. And if anyone feels differently, please, please jump in. Karen, did you go? Who's speaking? Go ahead, Hal. 
I feel the study session would be important primarily as a, a board driven event to discuss some key and critical issues related to whether or not we do or do not have business in the annexation. Um, and to think about the timeline from the point of view of OSBT. Um, because we have a unique ability here, being the landowner, we actually can make some proactive choices related to the timeline. To, and, and I'm uniquely willing sometimes to say things very directly and I'm gonna do it here. We have been asked by many people in the, in the city itself to divorce our, our thoughts about annexation from our look at this flood wall on our land. I respect and honor those thoughts. Those people who make those requests also must honor that our email boxes are flooded each and every day by people who think our responsibility to the charter has all these complex connections to the process of annexation. And I'll just make one example that I think is really pertinent. The fact that CU skipped a government required EIS through NEPA on its property in the past, does that create new costs to the project, to the um, city as a whole that would not have been there had they complied with those environmental costs? The general theme of all the emails we receive is a feeling that CU is not um, being a fair partner in the ecosystem costs of the project. And so it becomes very difficult to separate these two things entirely. And I don't know how to solve that other than a trustee to trustee conversation about where everybody thinks we should be and their understanding of their responsibility to the charter, whether those considerations are relevant or not relevant. And I, I think that's just, I think that's an important discussion and it's clearly the discussion that the public would like us to have. And I think uh, we also, we being the open space board or the open space and mountain parks department have a template. Um, Karen, Karen has already identified that as a basis for our conversation at a study session. And it strikes me that we don't need to reinvent that wheel necessarily, but we need to certainly put some air into it uh, as far as uh, you know what we specifically think uh, both the issues that need to be addressed and how they need to be addressed and the timing for that addressing. Um, so I think Dan, to answer your question from my perspective, um, you know, I haven't looked at the granite agreement um, from years ago and I'm trying to remember, I, I think I might've actually been there at the time, but um, I don't know that I participated in it. So I, I don't have any real recollection of the specifics, but I do think it's a worthy template at least to base a conversation on as far as what we think the, the schedule and the timing of events from our perspective needs to be. Yeah, and I, I just want to comment on several of the, the statements that have been made. I agree with you, Hal, that there's, there are other elements from our 2018 and 2019 motions that need to be part of this consideration and background uh, documents and that uh, and and the other thing John that you didn't mention that probably should be part of the discussion is costs and as Hal has indicated you know where where responsibilities lie and and so I think we have several documents that, that could serve as the basis. And I agree with whoever said that, uh, I guess it was Hal who said uh, it would be more of a board-driven board study session going from several documents to sort of sort a lot of these things out while 
as as Caroline said, while well, Kurt's still around. <laughs> so I'm I'm just trying to think through as I think uh, Dan and John are what what the study session might be. Um, I think as Dan has alluded to, by the 19th or shortly thereafter, uh, the process committee will have we hope sort of blessed a general timeline for the coming year. And that certainly could be a basis for many of the topics that we're gonna to discuss to try to look at the various questions we have and concerns we have that we've expressed emotions and start hanging them on the timeline to say, well, um, we think there may be a decision about this issue at this point in time and therefore we need a report from these people, you know, a month earlier. Um, I, I can imagine that discussion being there with Dan and John. I don't think they would need to do a lot of preparation. I don't think we would need a lot of staff preparation as long as we're willing to accept the answer for some things that uh, we don't know yet. Um, I could also imagine maybe uh, Joe Tadeucci and maybe Phil Kleisler being at that study session so that when we ask about the nexus between um, CU South, you know, when will decisions be made on the OSO, he can say, well, either he's gonna say, I don't know, or he's gonna give us his thought about when it's likely to be. So I could see that conversation happening and I, I can't say it wouldn't be useful. I don't think there would need to be a lot of prep for it because these are things that people will either know the answers for or it will be unknown. That's, that's my sense, but I, I toss it to Dan to give his thoughts. Yeah, um, to be quite honest, I'm, I'm still a little confused by um, um, whether or not that there's, it sounds like in March there is a, uh, a, an interest to teen up, con, uh, continuing to talk about a future disposal request that we may or may not get. And that teen up issues unrelated to the specific annexation type of negotiations and, and the terms of that. It's, it's, it's so, it, 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 correct me if I'm wrong. It, it sounds like Annexation, flood mitigation from the board's perspective, it doesn't really matter. It's all crossed and that there's interest in talking about sort of working through your mind, uh, all the issues and, 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 and how, what you need to say at this point versus uh, the timeline for delving into other aspects at a later date, uh, regardless of whether it's a flood mitigation component or an annexation component. Um, uh, what do you think, Dan? Dan, what do you think the city would say? Because uh, we do have to think about this too. If we said, okay, um, the week of the 21st of February or the 28th, uh, we're going to have a study session to talk about the timelines for CU South annexation decisions that might affect open space and the timeline for uh, the flood control project uh, decision making. What do you think would be the response of the city and maybe council? Well, I mean, I, I, I can just tell you the so the commitment we've made uh, internally because there's so many departments involved and so many staff is that we will we, we're using the funnel of the process subcommittee to do the daylighting for when the community could expect certain meetings and certain issues and and they get the blessing of the subcommittee uh, to. You know, so that that's sort of the touch points with our community, with the board and the commission. So um, to do it sort of on a parallel track from what's being brought forward is, is a little bit of concerning for me, but maybe that's just bureaucratic concern. <laughs> but uh, I, you know, we have all been trying to honor that process of, of using the process subcommittee as a way to sort of funnel it all and, and to put it together. And, and to have that sort of, so I would feel like we would want to raise this uh, at the process of committee or, or even beforehand yeah. to put some notice out there that, you know, we know that 
you know, we've been trying to all fund it through and this has come up unexpectedly and, and still put some daylight to it um, would, be, would be something I, I, I would feel I have an obligation to do. Sure, on the 19th or before, I, th that makes a lot of sense. I can't imagine the process committee or council would be surprised that we're concerned about these issues and that there's an interest to know more about the sequence of events, the timelines, the decision points. Now, maybe their answer to you would be, you know, it's too early to try to get details about that. Um, I don't know. I don't know if they would say that. What do you think? Well, I'm wondering if you would, John, I know you wanted to say something before I, I chime in one more time on an idea, but go ahead. Oh, um, and, and I don't know if this is helpful, Dan, but it, if you look at this from a, sort of a project management standpoint, uh, the way I see it is that the critical path right now is annexation, that the council's weighing in the key agreement points, annexation, 30% design, then possible disposal. And so a lot of the things that sort of Karen is raising here in, in the document that she shared and, and her good point about cost, those are all things that are kind of, are not directly related to annexation. So they, they can come after we have more information and more certainty around the design, the 30% design. So it's really right now on that critical path, the key things are, are it is what the board is likely to need in the right um, it, it, it being considered by council for the negotiation over annexation or not. Mm -hmm. And if there are things that are not being considered that you all think will be critical later on, that those are the things to focus on right now. And I don't think, and, and the timing is so tight that it's not really a study session issue. It's a, it's a make a motion and and say what you think the key agreement point should be other than than what you've already stated which is has to do with the land and the water but if there are other things that relate to how the mitigation project could move forward that we're missing or something that would be really super helpful to know i just don't see what they are right now and and, and yeah, that's, that, that's related to my request for a study session because I'd like to take a straw poll of my trustees to see if they do or do not agree that the history of ecosystem non-investment at CU South over history is relevant to where the mitigation responsibility will ultimately fall under this deal and whether that's something we want to communicate expressly to council. Because, because it just strikes me as very important um, heading into this annexation discussion to recognize that the property owner has a unique position that may not be funneled as effectively as people would like. I understand the desire to build a funnel on this project. I also understand the desire of everyone I speak to in Boulder, who is my constituent, not wanting it to be funneled. Yeah, Caroline, do you want to colloquy on Hal's point? Yeah, um, again, I'm just gonna, each time I speak, to try and keep it short and sweet. Um, Dan, I hear what you say, and John, I hear what you say, and um, I just would like to say I, I respectfully disagree, and I would, after hearing your points and, and your critical pathways and what you would like to do. Um, if it pleases the other board members, I would still like to have a study session and still let us have the opportunity to speak about the things that we find important. Um, and again, be able to do so in a time frame where we still have Kurt. And I think that these issues are relevant to all of us now. And um, it, would, it would be great for us to be able to sit around a table and, and be able to really talk about what we need to talk about. And make a suggestion then that, um, so we have March 14th out there in four weeks. I do have uh, 
uh, commitment from Joe and Phil that they could be available on that day. That will provide us with enough time to build this into the process subcommittee so we could daylight this uh, to them. Hey, Dan, and are you talking about March 14th? You March said 14th, March. which is our regular board meeting. One idea is that- well, well, I'm sorry, the 10th of March is our board oh, meeting. Oh, sorry, the 10th of March, four weeks, yeah. Behind, right? Yeah. Uh, so one suggestion could be is if we held the study session on the 10th of March and then moved our regular meeting date back to a week or two after that, hmm. that way you will have a chance to see the schedule, um, hear process committee's discussion. Uh, I've got commitment from Phil and Joe that they can join us on the 10th. It would just, which we have to schedule another meeting anyway. So <clears throat> my suggestion would be is that we keep the 10th date call it a study session and see you, and then have a, a second meeting in which we'll call it a regular meeting and see if we can address some of the uh, standard items at that time in which you could also, if there was a motion or some sort of official thing you wanted to come out, you would have a chance to then work on that and present it at that regular board meeting, uh, still in March, so still under Kurt's uh, tenure. So just a suggestion. Does that mean we could not meet on February 24th? Which is well, the fourth Wednesday? I mean, I, I, I mean, my personal calendar looks open, but I mean, I would, I don't know what support and, and if you want any, um, I mean, there's. Karen, were you thinking an evening like our, stay, our same 6 p.m. or something different? No. An evening meeting. Okay, then then that date would work for me. I'm I'm, I'm sorry. Which day are we talking about now? February twenty fourth. February twenty fourth. So, John, uh, while we're looking at whether the dates work, I guess I would flip your observation and say it would be very helpful for the board for perhaps you and Dan to at this study session to lay out why you think uh, we have sufficient information on the environmental uh, issues related to the annexation um, that are contained in the, uh, you know, the report. Are you referring to the briefing book, Dave? Yeah, the briefing book, the yeah. The briefing book. What, so I guess I would say, okay, we would like to hear from staff if, if you're satisfied with the, the content of the briefing book, whether it's sufficient. And we could also have the conversation about why some of us may not be, um, and that there may be other issues that uh, we think you know should be uh, under consideration. I, I agree with that, and I would also like to reiterate the concept of looking broadly from the 2018 motion and the 2019 motion and, and the components uh, that were addressed with the granite property to really look holistically at all the elements that we've been considering for the last few years that we know are all relevant to what happens with this property and what happens with flood mitigation and also address John's question of, is there anything else that we have not yet considered um, in a holistic kind of way? It, and I, it and I, quite frankly, I'm not sure that for that conversation we need utilities or planning departments. But one example in my mind, John, I guess, is the status of the uh, berm on the CU property, the current, the current berm, and mm -hmm. whose responsibility it will be to remove it. So that, yeah. what, and then what's the cost estimate for that and who will be responsible for paying that cost? And, you know, so I think I don't know. I'm not, where, the, where the spoils go, right? 
Well, yeah, yeah. how that happens, and I, I'm not going to speak for the entire board, but I think there are several of us who are concerned about you know, the potential flood mitigation as it relates to the CU South property itself. And, um, you know, the fact is, is that there have been no commitments on any of this. And, and so I guess we're not uh, sanguine that, um, you know, that what we think should happen is necessarily going to happen without some definite clarity and commitment. Yeah, and, and Dave, my, my only point was about the timing. So um, right now, without a 30% design that kind of starts to tell us, you know, what's the mitigation requirement going to be, and then what's the mitigation opportunity, what does that look like? That, um, th that sort of question about that you're raising, like with the berm, comes more in that space than now, particularly if the key point for council, the key negotiating point is the city acquire the 119 acres with the berm on it. Then we decide we can decide later how we deal with that and you know who who does what and where mm -hmm. the fill is used. As long as we acquire the property in fee simple, it it um, th that can that decision can be addressed later on. It doesn't have to be hardwired at right now when we're still a little bit unsure about what the project is exactly it, it's all in the timing and you know and i was i was really just encouraging um the board to think very you know carefully about what are the key factors that we need to focus on in the annexation not the things that can wait when we have more information about the flood project well and just i'll just we point out for the mitigation folks. issues. And so I guess I, I don't see the, uh, the need to wait until there's a 30% I agree. Know, uh, project team. I, we know what we think the appropriate mitigation should be. And we want a commitment that that's if this project gets constructed, that's what the mitigation commitment will be. Okay. So Dave, Dave, I just want to uh, remind that we do have two sets of motions, three actually. And one of the things the board uh, adopted in a motion for just for example, to take your example, is that the berm would be removed and restored at the project cost. I don't know that we'll be able to say much more about that at the end of February or in March, staff has already made that clear. Yep. Uh, we may have concerns about whether that's foremost in people's minds, but I also don't think it's a decision that's gonna be made during the annexation discussion right now. So again, it might not be a bad idea. And I think Karen's referenced this, at some point to walk through all of our previous motions and say, okay, we want to ensure this. When is that decision going to be made? Um, and to make sure that there's clarity amongst the board about is that what we want as our current proposal? Do we still want the firm to be removed and restored at the project's cost? Some of those decisions, I think, are going to be made down the road. As Dan and John have said, are there things that are critically linked to the annexation agreement? that we haven't already taken a position on, like the 119 acres. Well, I think, uh, so I agree with that, Kurt, but I think going back to what Hal was uh, saying earlier is that uh, I'm, I'm not convinced that the removal of the CU berm is necessarily a project cost, uh, you know, where the city underwrites the removal of the berm. In fact, that may be a requirement of CU as part of the annexation agreement. And so I think that or the annexation agreement. Uh, I, don't hmm. know. I hmm. think that what we need is some estimate of what that will require. Um, and then, yeah, I agree that it's, at some point the, the decision on who pays for it is going to have to be made. But I don't think it's a, a done deal that it's a, a project cost that the city necessarily has to pay for. Al, did you want to add to that and then Caroline? 
Um, yeah, for, uh, humor uh, some heuristics quickly um, to the point of we don't know that much about the project. We know it's a half mile long concrete dam, uh, some of which will be in threatened species area. We know that it's abreast of South Boulder Creek, an area we've been focused on mitigating for decades. We, we know that had the original reclamation plan for CU South been followed, there'd be a lot more Ute Ladies, Tress, and Prebles jumping mouse there today than there are today. We do know that if the levee hadn't been built, uh, the, there'd be quite a bit more wetland and natural setting there. I, I just want to make sure that city council feels empowered to, to go into a meeting with CU and ask questions that are very simple to say, since you chose not to participate in the NEPA process, do you understand how that leaves us now with work requirements related to mitigation that would not be there had you done what you said you were going to do? Or ex explaining some of the elements about how they're actually a holistic partner in this project as opposed to the current feeling, which is we negotiate as a city against ourselves everything around what is going on here while CU sits stationary and hasn't moved one inch since the bad news about this not being able to be on CDOT's right-of-way. And, and basically for people to understand that how you read and interpret the charter and what the intent of the charter was can actually hinge on those types of things because it's about equitable sharing of ecosystem costs. And, and so However, as a board, we want to we want to make clear that that actually is an element here. People may not like that it's an element, but it's an important element, and it's not just in our imaginations. It's clearly in the written words I receive from every single Boulderite that emails me on this subject. Caroline. Well, it's hard to follow something like that with what Hal just said, so um, I'll make it easy. <laughs> so I'll just make it easy and say, uh, I will echo the same sentiment says him and we can keep moving. We have flexibility. So your goal is to be able to have a study session and probably a regular meeting prior to Kurt's departure. So that's the bottom line. And there is nothing magical about two weeks from tonight. I mean, I think that, I think it would be helpful for the board to have some staff support, whether it's Phil or Joe or yeah. otherwise, we're just mm -hmm. the information we have now and, and circulating it around. I, there's not gonna be a lot we could, you know, prepare for, but um, it could be beneficial. So, um, if we could have some flexibility of just working out when the timing would be, as long as we met the end goal that you're expressing to me, which is a study session and a regular board meeting before Kurt's departure. That's kind of what I'm hearing. And, and, and I will just weigh in to say, I do see some advantage to um, having a little bit more time before the study session. Um, so your, your idea of having the study session replace the March 10 meeting and move as we are allowed, if you will, uh, our board meeting until the uh, 24th. I accept that I'm planning on being out of town that week. Well, and that's the other thing is too, is rather than doing it here, we could circulate, making sure we get a date that is gonna work. Okay, yeah, yeah. Tell me, well, Kurt, and, tell me Kurt, a little bit more about why you want more time. Well, partly I'm trying to make sure we can get folks like Phil and Joe here. Um, I think it is really valuable to be able to ask them questions and not just be, you know, discussing this amongst ourselves, because I think a lot of the uncertainty we're grappling with is, is stuff that's out of our control. We're not controlling the timeline for CU South or for the flood project. So having the people who are in charge of those timelines at the meeting, I do think is really valuable. So that's just my thought, Karen. And then I'll go to Caroline after you 
if you have any thoughts, Karen. Um, I th my impression is that we have a lot of things to sort out among ourselves as a board. Um, and, and my impression is that they don't hinge heavily on 30% design, um, but that they do uh, hinge heavily on your departure, Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, and I also think it's very important to have this study session before our next board meeting. So the sequence of study session first and board meeting thereafter is important to me. Yeah, I think that was the proposal either way. Um, I just have the feeling that we're gonna to wanna to be able to ask people, what's that? The other element that, that we're not going to have there one way or the other is is the deliberations with CU and I would not want um, CU to be a party of, of the study session, but. Yeah. Um, hmm. but, but do you wanna be able to ask people like Joe, when is the board gonna get briefed on the groundwater model? Um, things like that, uh, or is that not of, of interest to you? Well, I think if we had questions that, that John and, and Dan couldn't answer, that there would be time uh, on March 10th to have, I think Dan said that Phil and, and Joe are available on March 10th. And you don't think it would be advantageous to have them there as part of a study session. I don't know, Mike. Well, if I could, if I yeah. may jump in Thank you. off of that just real quick. Um, I really just want the opportunity to be able to speak with the other board members freely. So um, Dave has expressed a couple of things that he uh, you know, said would be nice for staff to be able to take a look at. I wonder if the other board members would like to add in if they have something like Dave is able to make that request at this meeting, if there's something pressing that they have. Um, I do not. So that puts that out there. So if um, Karen or Kurt or Hal have something, then they can know tonight. And if not, then we move forward with the, the idea that this is um, not as much uh, staff involvement at, as uh, or needing of their participation as it is for us to be able to have um, the discussion that, you know, serves us. Okay. Hal, it looked like you were about to say something. No? Uh, no, no, I just, um, I, I, I guess my only comment is I, I agree. And we're as a board, we're, we're honor bound by the law to have public meetings in our discussion in public. And I just hope everybody recognizes this is our attempt to honor those commitments to the law, to have a public discussion amongst ourselves on a topic of critical concern. Okay. So it sounds like the board's preference is to have a study session in February, is that what I'm hearing? Please nod. Yes. Okay. Well, we can ask Dan to see if he can, and, and is it also the board's desire to not have people there from utilities or planning? Not one way or the other. I don't mind if someone would like to attend you know, if, if they would like to be there, then that's fine. But I don't know that we um, need them to do any preparatory work to be there. Okay, and you don't want them there to ask them questions about their timeline? If they're there and a question does come up, that would be, um, you know, nice to have them there for that. Um, but this is short notice. And if they can't make it, I, I think that it seems like we would all still move ahead. I don't have strong feelings one way or the other, Kurt. 
I don't, I don't either. Okay. Um, I, I would like for us to have a common set of documents in front of us for that meeting. Um, and, and I, so I, I mean, I think the 2018 and 2019 motions um, I don't think there's anything in the upstream option motion. There may be. Right. No, I think you're right. And of course, we have the summary that uh, Dan and staff put together of those motions, uh, 2018, 2019. So that document exists to share. Uh, Karen, what about the granite and, well, that you looked yeah, at? I'd, I'd be glad to to uh, forward the granite document that I showed you earlier. There's another document that I was working on in January that I could offer as a... a possible document for everybody to take a look at too. And what was that about, Karen? It was a parallel from the granite property for South Boulder Creek property. Okay. I think that would be helpful. Um, <clears throat> I, you know, it, if it would be possible to have uh, a representative from CU who is part of their environmental leadership group that that would be helpful to me uh, you know th that that would be really interesting to me and I, I what do you mean by environmental leadership you mean uh, some, you know somebody at cu who's in a leadership role that takes some responsibility for their commitments which they advertise on sustainability ecosystem awareness etc somebody somebody who actually is you know thinking about partnering on this this beautiful piece of boulder I don't think anyone from CU has filled that capacity, Hal. Maybe it was a symbolic question, forgive me. <laughs> well, I mean, if there, if there is a person for that role, we could certainly send an, e an invite. And it, would, it would go a long way to us feeling like we had a good faith partner in the project, that's for sure. You know, um, all, all I will say uh, in that regard, folks, is, um, it's our job to express what our interests are as the Open Space Board of Trustees and to do what we can to make sure staff understands what their needs are. Um, negotiations with the university, and I know you're not saying this is a negotiation, but I think the city's really gonna wanna handle that through the group that's already been established to have that negotiation. So, um, I mean, I think we've all aired a long list of concerns about that property and how it was developed, but I don't think we're going to make much progress with the university saying you need to undo what you did in the past. I, that's my thought. It, it doesn't mean we can't state what we think we need to know and what we think we might need to uh, mitigate the effects of the project. I am a little concerned that the focus of this upcoming um, study session become focused almost entirely on the flood control project and mitigating for it. Uh, I think what Dan said is true that the most immediate concern we should have is how does CU South annexation touch on our interests and making sure that those interests have been fully spelled out. Now, I think we have spelled out what our interests are in terms of the land, uh, but if there are other things besides the land and the water for the Dry Creek Ditch, then I think that's what we should be focusing on for this study session because it's the most imminent. Yeah, I, I would just echo that. I mean, if there's outside of if there are issues that you could say is outside of annexation and it's more of like preconditions of <clears throat> what you would need to consider a future disposal request. Um, and, and if, you know, if you want to get detailed on that in February, 
Um, <laughs> we're, we're hoping that that through 30% design, we're going to uh, show that the original aspect of, for instance, up to five acres and some other aspects are actually going to be able to be reduced. Um, and we really don't have the full scope of what the ask is going to be. And then there's the issue of CDOT and whether or not we're going to get to an actual disposal request is, is, you know, still a question mark. And uh, so I would like some clarification from you, Kurt, because uh, I do feel I <clears throat> need to daylight this to process subcommittee this meeting because it, it is a public meeting and it is engagement. And uh, what the title should be is, are yeah. we, is, it, uh, if, is, is it a sort of a pre conversation and, and <laughs> or annexation related or? Yeah, uh, I'm gonna ask each member of the board to say what they think the title of this meeting is. And Karen, you can start. As a study session, I don't think it's an engagement session. At a study session, there's no public comment. This is strictly a board discussion. Of what? I mean, could we call it what it's under our title tonight? Um, I don't think it's an update. Didn't we have a word? Yeah, that's what it says. South Boulder Creek Flood Mitigation slash CU South update. Um, Ghost that system. would imply that we're going to get an update from the people that are managing the flood project and the CU South annexation. No, presumably we'd already have that because Dan has said that they're at the, the subcommittee meeting on the 19th. What if we are gonna present a timeline? Did I get that right, Dan? Uh, yeah, uh, a preliminary timeline or a draft timeline for process subcommittee consideration. If we took out the word update and just put in discussion. Board, dis yeah, board study session on, on South Boulder Creek flood mitigation and see you south. Discussion or, or yeah, just take out update and then leave it as that, yeah. I would, I would suggest we add the two words issues and timeline so that it becomes a little clearer to everyone exactly what it is that we're discussing. Other thoughts on the title? Thumbs up from Caroline. Thumbs up from Hawaii, Al, I mean. <laughs> I don't have any thumbs anymore. <laughs> My thumbs up. OK. Um, and again, I'm just going to ask the question. <laughs> it sounds like we're saying we don't need Joe there or anybody that's working on the annexation, because this is an internal discussion. Okay, that makes it easier for Dan and John to plan this if they don't need other department staff to be there. I think it will limit our information, but if that's the board's desire, that's the way we'll go. I, I, I just wanna comment. I feel a deflated vibe. Um, I'm, I obviously do not like that. Uh, I love this staff. This is not meant to symbolically be deflating, but you, I just ask staff, I guess, to have compassion for when you're a board member and you're not allowed to speak to your co-board members anywhere but in public, you actually do need to create space from time to time to do that. And, and that's what this is about. There's a lot of even really simple questions where I don't know where any of my co-board members feel or stand on basic issues. And we don't get a chance to ask those questions ever. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure we don't need outside resources for that discussion. It sounds like we're saying no. And I think uh, I'm confident in, in staff uh, providing the, the information that we need at this juncture. Okay. I, I agree. I think we've got a lot of resources. Uh, but 
again, if we need them to make presentations on something, we need to tell them soon. It sounds like we're saying, nope, y'all come. Yeah, we, we just need uh, a few documents and I think uh, we're good. Okay. Turn the lights on. And, yeah. and Turn the lights mind, on. Yeah. In my mind to be official, the documents have to be posted on the website. So it's not just the five of us that get them, it's they're available to the public as well. Is that correct or not? That's a good question. Yeah. Leah's going. I, I'd be willing to offer my time to work with Karen to create that PDF of pre-existing pre-received documents and also to set a basic agenda for the study session. That would be great. Yeah. Excellent. Right. We've already have the motions and then the granite document, Karen, sounds like you already have that. Um, so those two things are already on hand. We get an agenda put together. And so. Karen, the draft of whatever you were working on that you think might uh, inform our conversation would be helpful. Sure. Okay, I can, I can toss that into the mix. Right, there are three three things then, I think. Four, well. Four? <clears throat> uh, granite 20, amendment. 2019 granite. Yeah, the motions, granite, and the draft of whatever you've been working on. I see the motions as, you know, <clears throat> together. So John, I'm um, John's already done that, so we've got those, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think it would be good to have an agenda because that's what the public's going to focus on. Okay. And I'll keep in mind that what I'll you put on the agenda. On that. What's that? I'll work you will. With okay. Keep in mind that what you put on the agenda will be viewed as what we're going to be moving to make decisions on. So if, if we've got discussion of the specific requirements of a disposal, that conveys to everybody who looks at it that we're ready to move on a disposal motion. That may not be what you're really trying to say. So I would just say, be careful how you frame it on the agenda. But there will be no decisions at the study session. And so from my perspective, Kurt, uh, this is just anticipatory of um, you know, something that uh, might occur. If it does not occur, uh, we don't do it. That's right. right. I would just say, keep in mind that people will look carefully at the agenda, that's all. I'll let you guys work with Dan on that. Dan, do you need anything more than from us to try to figure out no, I just have a question for Leah. I think you're going to be out of town for the next week or so. Is that correct? Yes, I'm out until March 1st. Yeah. Um, so oh, we'll just have to figure girl. a way to, to do the Are you going to Hawaii too? I wish, Karen. Oh, <laughs> too bad. Um, so Allison should be able to help. Um, and, as, and as far as getting uh, postings out and stuff, <clears throat> that we could... You could get support for that. Yes. Okay. And Dan, you, you should probably say when you need the agenda and the documents by. Well, I mean, our practice is to get things out a week ahead of time, but that's, uh, we, there's flexibility in that. You know, if we get it in out, out by week's end next week, Leah, where that, I mean, right? It doesn't, I don't know when, when we need to have things officially posted by. Yeah, I mean, legally required, it's 24 hours. We just, as a practice, like to have a lot more than that. So yeah, end of week, Dan, is, is still plenty of time as long as um, this group, you know, is okay with that. Uh, can I ask Karen and Hal to have that? We can be done by Wednesday, can't we? Yes. That was my question. How about COB on the 16th? That's Tuesday. Pushy, pushy, pushy. <laughs> well, uh, no later than noon on the 17th so that we give them a bit of a working day to get the package ready to post. Okay. Okay. 
Any other requests here? Or Dan, do you need any more information? No, I think I'm good. Okay. Uh, any other matters from the board? Yeah, that's uh, okay. I appreciate the discussion, folks. I really do. Uh, these are important questions and uh, we need to learn as much as we can. All right. Well, if there are no other comments from the board, then we are adjourned. Thank you all. Not everybody. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You